promise is kept. This election is about your future. He will stand up for you. He supports you. And we are going to keep on winning, winning, winning. He's a tough, no-nonsense outsider who can't be bought or intimidated. We're going to stop the radical left. President Donald Trump believes in America. I'm the only thing standing between the American dream and total anarchy, madness, and chaos. President Trump gets things done. We have to do this. We have to go to the polls on November 3rd, and we will make America great again. Good evening. I'm Chuck Todd, and welcome to NBC News' special coverage of the 2020 Republican Convention. Right here on NBC News Now, we are roughly 30 minutes away from the start of the final night. And of course, that means the president. Tonight, Mr. Trump will deliver his convention address at the White House in front of a crowd of roughly 1,000 people, effectively transforming the South Lawn into a stage for a political convention complete with campaign billboards. I'll be honest with you, it's pretty jarring. Using the White House as a backdrop for such a major partisan event like this is unlike anything we've seen in the history of this country. Many an elected official tried to pass laws in order to prevent moments like this, a campaign sign on, a, on the people's house. As you can see, the chairs do not, even, uh, do not appear to be set up for social distancing. Washington, D.C. currently prohibits mass gatherings of more than 50 due to the pandemic, but the White House is on federal property, so district rules do not apply to them if they choose not to follow them. When the president speaks tonight, we expect he will reemphasize many of the themes from this week's convention. As you know, speakers have portrayed Mr. Trump as an unyielding defender of conservative Christian value. They've tried to frame his response to the pandemic as a success story, while also claiming that a victory by Democrats in November will unleash a wave of chaos and violence across America while not acknowledging that it's happening on their watch. The president's comments on issues of social unrest or racial justice or policing will be closely watched tonight as tensions are simmering once again across this nation after the shooting of Jacob Blake, a black man by police in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and after two people were shot dead amid demonstrations earlier this week by what appears to be a vigilante. Joining me now from the White House, where the president will speak tonight, is my NBC News colleague, Hallie Jackson. And Hallie, I just have to say, we knew we were going to see this night on the South Lawn. It is something else to see all this yeah. campaign paraphernalia on what is a building that belongs to the American taxpayers, not a political campaign. I have to imagine for you, Chuck, you have covered this building longer than I have uh, when you were Chief White House Correspondent yeah. here, and you've been to event after event after event. And yeah, we've seen the South Lawn decked out with, you know, staging for, for example, the Salute to America on the 4th of July, but not with, as you point out, those big Trump-Pence billboards there. Just want to explain, we're on the North Lawn here. There's some different logistical things going on to get the media in and out. You can imagine getting 1,000 people plus, by the way, in and out uh, is also sort of a logistical thing, especially when you when we talk about these COVID precautions that are that are be, being taken. But let's talk about those. I think you showed that live shot of all those chairs. Listen, I was out there a couple of hours ago for nightly news. They are not socially distanced. I mean, they're just not. I'm not great with spatial dimensions, but I know six feet versus six inches, and it's much closer to six inches than six feet, Chuck. Uh, and so the campaign has said, listen, we are taking proper protocols. I had a chance to ask Chief of Staff Mark Meadows about this. I said, are you comfortable with that? He said, I'm comfortable with it. I said, is everybody being tested? And he chose his words very carefully with me and other reporters. He said a number of people are being tested. Not everybody. He didn't say the word everybody. He didn't say the word nobody, right? He said a number of people. Here's the backstory there. What we've seen so far this week at these events that close out the evenings at the convention with live audiences are a small number of people who are closer to the front, right, closer that may have interaction with the president, the vice president, their wives, um, be tested, but not everybody in the audience necessarily uh, has been tested. So that is a question that has come up because we are in the middle of a pandemic, and that is the backdrop to the president's convention closing speech, crisis after crisis, the pandemic, the unrest in Kenosha, as you're talking about. By the way, the hurricane that caused major devastation to the parts of the Gulf Coast less than 24 hours ago, less than 12 hours ago even, the president is expected to address all of this news from his perspective. So, for example, when he talks about the unrest in Wisconsin, Chuck, the campaign says that he will talk about it in the framework of 
looking for an end to what he's going to call the violence here and in support of law enforcement officers, that thin blue line that you've heard Vice President Pence and others talk about here over the course of the convention. So it's a lot tonight, uh, but, I, but I think you're right sort of overall with the general atmosphere. It is very, very, we can't emphasize this enough, very unusual to have a, such a partisan yeah. campaign event like this happen on the grounds that lawmakers in the audience, by the way, made up of lawmakers, family, friends, donors, a lot of people coming in, by the way, from all over the country. It's it, it's it's striking in the pandemic, no doubt. But again, I mean, this is just it. it, it it's amazing. And an entire political party just thinks this is it is looking the other way. And Congress seems to be looking the other way on this one. Anyway, it's surprising. I know for people outside of Washington, they think we're being the silly ones. But no, there, there, there were some norms that we thought were, were going to get protected when it comes to but, America's capital yeah. and things that belong to the taxpayers. And let me jump in here too, Chuck, because, you know, and, I, and I've seen this, the point of these rules and these laws was was not that people would get outraged about it, right? It was for exactly this reason, that they didn't want it to become, you know, the laws were intended so that voters would not become blasé about seeing, to your point, you know, taxpayer resources like the White House, for example, these locations used as political backdrops because of what that might do to the setting and to the office. So no, the, it, the law was sort of intended that way. No, and the more you use it as a campaign setting, the less impactful it can be for the world, the less it is an icon for democracy. Anyway, it, it, is a, it is something that I think there's a reason these laws are put in there. There was fear of cheapening, cheapening this, and you don't want to cheapen the White House, cheapen uh, our capital this way. Anyway, it's a fascinating decision, and it is pretty jarring to actually see it all put together right now. Hallie Jackson getting us started. Hallie, thanks very much. Four years ago, then-candidate Trump first asked black voters, quote, what do you have to lose? And at this week's convention, Republicans have made notable efforts to rally black voters, including by featuring a number of black speakers. Well, joining me now is our own Morgan Radford, who sat down with some black voters in Charlotte, North Carolina, where the convention was originally going to be, uh, to talk about the president's 2016 pitch and where things stand today. Morgan, what'd you learn? That's right, Chuck. I went back to my home state of North Carolina, and that's where then-candidate Donald Trump was, there in Mecklenburg County, in Charlotte, when he asked that infamous question, what do you have to lose? Essentially saying, why not take a chance on me, even though we know that black voters disproportionately vote for the Democratic Party in overwhelming numbers. So I went back four years later to essentially ask the same question. In four years, what did you lose, if anything at all? And their answers may surprise you. They touched on everything from coronavirus to black unemployment employment and the president's relationship with race. Take a listen. When you think of that phrase, what do you have to lose? What goes through your mind now? What do I have to lose? I have everything to lose. Not only my business, but my livelihood, my life, uh, my home. I'm one step from being homeless. I have everything to lose from politicians, presidents, from all the way down who aren't listening who aren't here to provide the support that our communities need. So yes, I have everything to lose. Lowest black unemployment, lowest Hispanic, these are numbers that you can't argue. These well, are numbers you can't 30 million deny. people unemployed right now. Right now. I mean, this is the biggest unemployment wave we've seen since the Great Depression. But why? It's not because of him, it's because of coronavirus. So when we asked that question, what did you have to lose, some black voters, especially those who are Democrats, actually sort of rephased the question. And they told me, how much worse can things get? That was the new question, especially when you look at coronavirus deaths. 22 percent of overall coronavirus deaths in this country since the pandemic have been among black Americans. That's 36,000 black Americans who have died. And then when you look at black unemployment, black businesses that have been disproportionately affected, for example, 41 percent of black businesses have had to permanently close their doors since the pandemic began, and that's compared to 17 percent of white-owned businesses. So many of the Democrats and the independents we spoke to, who were the majority of the black voters there in North Carolina, said they do not believe that Trump has the vision or the skills to lead the country for another four years. Chuck? What about, um, what were their feelings about Joe Biden, and, and what, a, what kind of trust level was there for him? Um, what kind of verification, are they, you know, sort of what receipts are they looking for from him? 
that's a great question. And when I asked it, I was surprised. They said they feel like Biden is a better alternative to Trump, but they said what they haven't seen from Biden is a specific plan. They haven't seen a plan that details specifically the unique concerns of the black community. And then I said, well, when you're watching the RNC this week and you see that, you know, black people are taking to the stage in support of President Trump, does that at all sway your opinion? Does that put a dent right. in your thinking? They said, absolutely not. And one voter there in Charlotte, Chuck, I, she said to me, you know, I would ask the black people on stage at the RNC, has a Republican Party done something for black people as a whole or has it done something only for you? Chuck? Interesting question there. All right. Morgan Radford, uh, I have a feeling we're going to want to keep these conversations going uh, between now and November uh, and see if you anything betcha. changes from there. So thanks very much. Joining me now is my NBC News colleague, Casey Hunt, also host of KCDC Sundays on MSNBC, and Michael Steele, former advisor to Jeb Bush and John Boehner. Casey Hunt, um, tonight, I, I, I feel like one, one uh, problem the president might have is this. He speaks so much. He is always such the center of attention. His words are always taken of such importance in a moment and then disappear so quickly. Does, how much does this speech matter considering that tomorrow morning he could tweet something that just sends the news cycle into a tizzy? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Chuck, I think to a certain extent you just answered your own question. It's really I know, uh, I did. nothing that, that he... <laughs> that, <laughs> no, it's fine. But it's a point that we make over and over and over again and that we all marvel at because he'll say something and then, you know, they'll, they'll build up to it. They'll spend a lot of time and energy right. getting him to say it, arranging the stage for him to say it. And then he'll tweet in the morning and it's all right out the window. So I do think that's a question. I think that, you know, the, the, the real question I have is whether a big stage like this breaks through with voters who are thinking about maybe voting, maybe not, who are, you know, watching our colleagues on the Today yeah. Show tomorrow morning to see what happened, what unfolded. There are people who are not on Twitter, who are not following the day-to-day -day of all of this. Is he able to send a message to them? Although, you know, Chuck, I got to tell you, I'm still so struck by the images coming off I the South too. Lawn. And, you know, maybe that is oriented exactly at media figures who he loves to infuriate. But I never imagined I would see campaign banners in that site that we're looking at right now. It's stunning. Michael Steele, I'm just curious. You're a you're sort of a political junkie like Casey and I. I, th I think you, you sort of love this stuff before you love your partisanship or your ideology. I, I have to say, I, I just, it bugs me. I'll be honest. It looks, I'm, it's jarring. Yeah, I mean, I keep I keep trying to come up with with examples of things that it's like, and it's I keep coming back to the X Men movie Days of Future Past. Like that, we don't. You have to think of a science fiction or fantasy movie to think of a big partisan event on the South Lawn of the White House. It's just not something we do as Americans, and I think it sets a precedent that's probably going to be pretty hard to roll back. I think we should get used yeah. to a lot more partisanship in official functions, whoever wins the White House in November. Or do you think that we're, or do you think we'll go the other way and try to legis, legis, put some teeth in that Hatch Act? No, I, I think that there may be some revision of, of standards and norms, particularly if former Vice President Biden wins. I remember when George W. Bush was elected, he, he liked the example that Ronald Reagan had set by never taking his business coat off in the Oval Office. Right. Respect the office, respect the right. desk. I can see Biden doing that kind of thing as a matter of norms and customs. I don't see legislation coming out of this, to be honest with you. Casey, another challenge that I think the president has is it is always obvious when he's reading a speech versus when he does his rallies. And I just always wonder how authentic he comes across when he's reading a punchline versus when it is, you know when it's him, right? We all know when it's him. Yes. And he, we all know when he's reading off the prompter, you know, and I just always wonder about that, whether they, it doesn't impact the way it could because he doesn't know how to own the words that he reads off a prompter. Well, you have to think, Chuck, that that's part of why you're seeing these people packed together the way that we are, that they've put an audience on the South Lawn for him, because while some of it is related to the teleprompter, a lot of it is related to the fact 
that he feeds off the energy of a crowd. So even if he's reading something, he's able to react in real time. He's able to ad lib. Uh, he's able to kind of treat the situation differently. That's, I think, part of why uh, those speeches have often come across as more authentic uh, than mm -hmm. the ones that he's done inside the White House in serious moments. So, you know, I'm interested to see if we get a mix of that tonight. And, you know, I'm sure that there are some staffers out there who are extraordinarily nervous about whether or not the president's going to stay on the teleprompter, yeah. which is another thing I'm looking for tonight. Michael uh, Steele, is there, can the president, you know, should the president bother to try to reach out and broaden his base, or does he, since it looks like he's in this take it or leave it mode, they, they weren't trying to claim he's going to change his ways or change his tone, um, should he make sure this speech is very base-oriented and, and don't, don't try to pretend you're something you're not? You know, just as you were speaking about the president's base, I was kind of amazed to see the B-roll from the South Lawn there. Congressman Louis Gohmert, who is recovering from a COVID infection, seems to be at this event tonight. I don't know if anyone's reported yeah. that already, but I was just surprised to see yeah, him standing he is. there. We've, we've got uh, confirmation. We know he is. Yeah, that he, wow. he's supposed um, to be. Yeah. So, yes, no, the, look, the president's hope at this point is to diminish uh, the turnout for the Biden-Harris ticket by scaring middle-of-the-road voters with images of a democratic socialist apocalypse, while also motivating as many people as humanly possible to vote who support him. And so I think you'll yeah. see... You know, we've seen throughout this convention a real tension between those things, the sort of angry, fiery, dystopian speeches, followed by these examples from real Americans who have been helped by the president's policies. Right. And it'll be interesting to see how he personally balances those two competing interests in this, you know, the marquee speech of the night. We shall see. I'll be curious to how, how hard or how often he's worked at this speech. Uh, that is something... We'll also be able to tell pretty quickly as he starts uh, as he starts going. Casey and Michael, stick around. Uh, up ahead, I'm going to talk with former top Trump campaign staffer, one of his original campaign staffers, if you will, an OG, Sam Nunberg, about what he's expecting to see from the president tonight. But first, a look back at one of the more memorable moments from any Republican convention. How about Barry Goldwater in 1964? I would remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. And let me remind you also that moderation in the pursuit of justice is no virtue. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I gonna decide, take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. A country reeling from a pandemic and racial injustice. The story changes hourly. The president's push to get children back into school is sinking in among families who are debating the safety of it. It's the 11th hour. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. 
Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in depth. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. This year's election is going to be a little different. Instead of one election day, we now have a voting season. That special time of year when polls can open weeks before election day. When your mailbox can become a voting booth. When how you vote is just as important as who you vote for. How, when, and where to cast your ballot depends on your state. Tis the season to be prepared. This year, plan your vote. Welcome back for more on what we expect tonight. I'm joined by someone who knows this president pretty well, Sam Nunberg. He was an advisor to one of the earliest advisors to what became President Trump's 2016 campaign. Sam, it is uh, nice to see you, sir. First, I want to ask uh, uh, this little uh, question because you know him so well. The fact that Mike Pence's night did not rate and that the numbers went down, not only compared to Kamala Harris, but compared to the second night of the Republican convention, how much do things like that bother the president? Well, I'm, I'm sure he's perturbed. But then again, as you would well know, there are numbers that they are talking about. I spoke to somebody who works, uh, who actually spoke to him today. And their argument is, well, look at the streaming. We're getting much more uh, YouTube viewers. People don't want to watch. Another complaint they're saying is that people don't want to watch uh, the convention because the networks are stopping it in the middle uh, for corrections. But yes, I, I think that is something that he didn't necessarily... Uh, be happy with and and the campaign itself used the uh, used the eventual Pence uh, Harris debate as probably the second most important debate besides the first in the first thirty minutes with Biden going in. So I think that you're you're going to see this president even because of that try to get more uh, try to get more crowd involvement as you can see with the crowd that that's there. what I wondered yeah so, that, that he now feels as if, okay, it's on me to keep interest, it's on me to get people fired up, it, it, that, that that would be the reaction he would have, that he would assume, well, if I'm not, if I'm not there, people aren't tuning in, that that's what I assume he would take away from something like that. You know, I heard two months ago, people that were planning this, they presented him a bunch of options. Some of the options sounded very good. Uh, particularly, they were very happy to hear that Biden uh, decided to stay in Delaware. They thought, you know, as Wisconsin, is one of the states that they need to win to get to 270. It would have been a great place to hold the final event. They presented, obviously, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, which he talked about publicly. But I had always thought, and I said to them, that he's going to end up wanting to do this at the White House, that yeah. this is also yeah. for posterity. This is something where he's not only thinking about laying the markers to get uh, for, the final, for the final run into the election day to put out the choices he sees it, to give his argument of what he accomplished and where he could take the country, but... It's also for him to have that um, that great optic, as he would say, to have that picture that you know that he would love to show people, and it's going to be something that he'll have wherever he is, either a year, either a year from now or uh, five years from now. That's this tonight will be on his desk. Sammy, I was just going to say, you know him so well. You think that this framing of the White House, the way it looks, with these two big Trump Pence billboards, he thinks is fantastic. A hundred percent. I think that, look, this is this is something where, and I think the president is, this is effective. I think this is something where if you had last week where I didn't really see a lot of, um, uh, I didn't really see a lot of, the, I didn't really see a lot of policy, let's say. I saw, obviously, they don't like Donald Trump. And yes, we're, uh, we're suffering through a pandemic. This is something where he thinks that he looks uh, presidential. He's giving a, a contrast. It's going from an empty arena that Joe Biden uh, spoke in last week, and now he has a crowd here and the White House, and it looks like the House of the People. But sure, he thinks that this is a win, and he thinks that this is something that they have pulled out, and it's something that nobody else will ever do. And he won't be surprised, I'm sure he thinks, as well as your previous guests were saying, Chuck, that other presidents will start doing this. What about the, what about the issue of COVID? I mean, you mm -hmm. already have... Herman Cain uh, death that may or may not have been due to the Tulsa rally. This is a lot of people not socially distancing. I assume this is not something they would want on their watch to have happen. 
but it don't, it, you know, with that many people crowding into a space, you're tempting, uh, you're tempting a virus here that, that we have proven we can't control yet. Yes. With that said, they all take rapid tests, as you may know, when they, when they enter the White House grounds. Sure, but not everybody's getting tested. We've already been told that. There's 1,000 people on the South Lawn. They're not testing everybody. Well, then, uh, then that, that could be an issue, and that was, it, and that was an issue after Oklahoma. Um, I, I would hope that, you know, if that's something that is a big risk to take, I agree with you. And, by the way, it's the kind of risk that if something like that happens, as did in Oklahoma, then it's, then it's a legitimate story to cover. If it doesn't, it's something that I'm sure the president will note as well in the coming weeks. So it, it is a risk. But he'd rather take this risk, you think, which to me seems like it's like he's got one shot at this because he's got a little bit of an inside straight to make a comeback. It just seems to take on more risk like that seems as if you're tempting fate. Well, you, you heard this argument, I think, if you look at the last couple of days, uh, focus on the main on the mainline speakers. Uh, so on, on Monday, let's say that was mm -hmm. that was culture war day. Right. And you have Don Jr. out there saying uh, Joe Biden wants, you know, uh, shutdowns in perpetuity, right? Mm -hmm. And then on, and then on, and then on Tuesday, uh, the first lady talks and uh, tries to give a softer side of the president, and they talk about it and they and they present the first stage of going in and speaking and speaking out of the rose garden. Last night, Vice uh, President Pence, he not only attacks Joe Biden but obviously Kamala Harris. They will make an issue that Kamala Harris is a quarter of a heartbeat away from the presidency. And then now tonight, this president wants to say that, uh, you know, they, they are getting through COVID. He's banking on economic numbers. And he's going to talk about the foreign policy as well that uh, Rick Burnell brought up. I think that he is going to make sure that what he what, what the campaign does see, Chuck, when you talk to them, is mm -hmm. they see a path that is broad from the point of view of they think Minnesota's in play. Mm -hmm. They think their, their internal polling shows them in a better place in Minnesota than they would have thought, and frankly, in a better place than they are in Ohio right now, from what I hear. And they think that there is a, that there is a way to play what is going on now to show that I'm the one who can lead this comeback. Here it is. I want to get back to normal, help the country. forward, and, and he's willing to take that risk. And he's doing it, by the way, of course. It's very important to know with Mark Burnett producers. <laughs> of course, of course. Uh, Sam Nunberg, uh, as always, sir, thanks for coming on, sharing your perspective with us. Uh, it's always good to have it. Thank you. Still with us, Casey Hunt and Michael Steele. Uh, so, Michael, uh, if for this speech to be effective tonight, he would need to do what? He has to lay out a vision for how he's going to build the economy back better and celebrate the achievements of his term in his own terms. But I think the second part is the mo excuse me, the first part is the hardest part of that, because he doesn't really have an affirmative image of what a successful second term looks like. Casey Hunt, um, Mitch McConnell speaks tonight. Um, it's, uh, and I know that we have embargoed remarks, um, but it does, it, it is amazing to me how Oh, I guess he was hesitant to participate or not, or was the Trump White House hesitant to have him participate? That's still an unanswered question, isn't it? It is unanswered, and it was a rare misstep uh, from the McConnell team. I mean, don't forget, he, of course, is up for re-election in his home state of Kentucky. And while they're not terribly worried he's going to lose to Amy McGrath, they always fight like they are worried. So, you know, I'm sure that every decision he's making in this regard is also playing into his campaign as well as... Uh, to his sensibilities about the majority. Uh, but, you know, the challenge, Chuck, and, and you know, I think we'll, we'll, we can expect to hear McConnell attack Joe Biden here. What Michael Steele was saying about the, the second term agenda, we, we just got a new interview from the president with Peter Baker in The New York Times, and he, again, couldn't really articulate what he would do with a second term. He had a lot of platitudes to offer. And, you know, Baker makes the point that it's so unclear what this president wants to do with a second term from an agenda perspective that the Republican Party dispensed with the platform altogether. And that makes it really hard for, you know, Republicans who are trying to make an argument that, well, I may not like what the president tweets or what he says, but I'm with him on policy because it's really hard to nail that down. So, you know, I think right. you're, you're going to see from, from McConnell tonight uh, a push against the other side more than necessarily uh, any sort of favorable argument for Donald Trump. Well, we shall see. I mean, it is, I'm sure we're also going to hear a little bit from him. And the question is, how strong is the check on 
Nancy Pelosi argument that he makes, how strong will that come across and look like, hey, we're your, we're your safety valve in case Trump loses? Casey Hunt, Michael Steele, thank you both. Thank you all for being with us tonight. The program for the final night of the Republican National Convention will be starting here in about 10 seconds. We've told you, you got Mitch McConnell. The president uh, is in the 10 o'clock hour. Ivanka Trump will be introducing him. Ben Carson is also speaking tonight. So here you go. Program starts now. Someone once said that America is great because it is good. And that if America ceases to be good, it will no longer be great. It is the goodness in Americans that informs the greatness of America. The freedom to do what is right and good for yourself, your family. To reap the blessings of hard work, to accomplish dreams, to live securely, to help others. Not by force of government, but by goodness of heart. Where rights are not granted by government or claimed by identities, but are unalienable as members of the human race. Today, America's greatness is challenged by those with extreme notions. Defunding law enforcement as lawlessness abounds. Hateful rhetoric, telling you what to wear and when you can work. Limiting free speech and freedom of worship. Old ideas of social packaged in redefined words. Let us restore the values that made America great. We will make America strong again. Return to the higher standard. We will make America proud again. A land of freedom of speech, of worship. We will make America safe again. A land of security and prosperity. And we will. Washington, D.C. Welcome to the 2020 Republican National Convention. Tonight, celebrating America as the land of greatness. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, which art in heaven, we thank you for the great bounty you have bestowed on this nation and the many blessings we have received these past four years. We are forever grateful. As we come tonight, our country is facing trouble. Tens of thousands are in the path of a deadly storm. The pandemic has gripped millions of hearts with fear. We are divided. We have witnessed injustice. Anger and despair have flowed into the streets. We need your help. We need to hear your voice at this crucial hour. We ask that you would unite our hearts to be one nation under God, for you are our only hope. We declare today our total dependence upon you and our need of repentance as a people. I thank you tonight for our president, Donald J. Trump, we pray that you would give him wisdom from on high, clarity of vision, and strength as he leads this nation forward. Bless him. We pray for our First Lady Melania, their son Baron, and all of the family. Protect them and keep them strong and safe. We thank you for Vice President Mike Pence, for his steady hand and clear voice. We pray for Second Lady Karen Pence and their family. Father, we know that you can make this nation great once again if we turn our eyes and our hearts to you and follow your word in obedience. May your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. And we pray this in the mighty name of your Son, 
my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. As Americans, we carve our own destiny. As Americans, we look forward, not backward. Our ancestors braved the unknown. They built this nation brick by brick. They lifted up millions from poverty, hunger, and disease. They vanquished fascism and communism. A great nation because of great people. And no one has done more to protect and advance it than President Trump. As Republicans, we are proud to stand with him and to work for you. Together, we built the greatest economy the world has ever seen, and we will do it again. We confronted China head on, tore up bad trade deals and made better ones, supported our men and women in uniform, and took out the world's top terrorists, achieved energy independence, defended the sanctity of life, and restored law and order at the border. But as every American knows, we face an invisible enemy that we didn't ask for nor invite, but we will defeat it. We will defeat it because America is where innovation happens and we are developing a vaccine in record time. We will defeat it because President Trump unleashed a Marshall Plan for Main Street and put hardworking taxpayers back on their feet. We will defeat it because tough times don't last. Tough Americans do. And that is what this election is all about. You, not us. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris think this election is about the government. They're wrong. It's about your family and your future. And to secure what really matters, we will call on the bedrock of what makes us the greatest country in the world, the American promise. A promise that everyone is equal under God, under the Constitution and under the law promise that government is accountable to we the people. A promise that if you work hard and play by the rules, your opportunities are endless. As Republicans, it's our mission to renew the American dream, restore our way of life, and rebuild the greatest economy in the world. The Socialist Democrats have a different agenda. They will dismantle our institutions, defund our police, and destroy our economy. So as you cast your vote this November, remember this. Four years ago, President Trump promised to be your voice. He kept that promise. But there's still so much more to do. The choice before you could not be clearer. Forward in freedom or backward in socialism? Forward in prosperity or backward in poverty? Forward in personal liberty or backwards in more government control? I know which direction I'm headed. Join us, because the best is yet to come. Smith. 20 years ago, I moved to Washington, D.C. to attend Howard University. I was at a crossroads, just like America is today. I grew up on Strand Hill Road in Cleveland, a blue-collar street in a blue-collar city. When the media talks about forgotten places or working-class people, who are overlooked and struggling hard, there's usually some stock photo of people who don't look like me. They never seem to show people like my mom, who worked two jobs as a gas station clerk, and a mom, she showed me how to persevere. They never seem to show people like my dad, who plowed snow in the winter and paved streets in the summer who stood by me through thick and thin, 
and taught me strong values every day. They never seemed to show people like me. At first, I didn't live the values my parents taught me. I won a starting spot on the varsity football team, but I only had a 1.9 GPA. But then I broke my leg. It took a broken leg for me to really get moving in life. I prioritized schoolwork, went to Howard, and ended up working for the President of the United States. Growing up, I'd never really known a Republican. I believed all the stereotypes. It took a meeting Republicans who shared my values to show me I was wrong. Donald Trump knows that in the work of revitalizing communities, America's strength is America's people. And I can tell you, he really cares and he takes action. Every issue important to black communities has been a priority for him. Prison reform, rebuilding broken families, bringing jobs back to America. Jobs in Cleveland, jobs in Detroit, jobs in Milwaukee. President Trump knows that education is the great equalizer. That's why he secured record and permanent funding for historically black colleges and universities and is fighting hard for school choice. In the wake of the murder of Ahmaud Aubrey, George Floyd, and legend Talaferro, a moment of national racial consciousness, I have seen his true conscience. I just wish everyone could see the deep empathy he shows to families whose loved ones were killed in senseless violence. President Trump has made it clear that if you want safe communities, you must have police departments with the highest standards. I'll never forget Strand Hill Road or the people of Cleveland. They're tough, smart, and tell it like it is. That's President Trump. For a New Yorker, he's got a lot of Cleveland heart. And I'm proud to say that he's my president. God bless America. People assume that if I'm not a Democrat anymore, then I must be a Republican or I must be conservative. I still consider myself a liberal, but liberalism has changed and I don't fit there anymore. As a black kid growing up in Texas, we were taught that you had to support Democrats because Republicans were for white people, supporting the rich, and we definitely weren't rich. Basically, our default setting is to be a Democrat. I'm a Democrat. My parents are Democrats. I was a huge Obama supporter. In the 2016 primary, I voted for Bernie Sanders. I mean, I was a socialist. And it wasn't until we got married and began expecting our own family that I began to kind of question whether or not the things that we were really promoting and supporting were in line with the way we were living. And that was when the shift kind of began for us. I was renting a room in this woman's apartment. She had three or four kids from three or four different fathers. She was my age. Most of them were incarcerated. I asked her, what do you do? She goes, I'm in the system. It feels like Democrats sort of get people hooked on this drug of free money, where they basically say, you know, if you want your fix, you have to keep voting for us. Then this bold man comes down an escalator in New York City. I couldn't come out and say it right away, but deep down inside, I knew it was gonna be the first Republican that I ever voted for.
his entire campaign, Worse for All Americans. That was a turning point for me. One of the hardest things to do is to challenge your own beliefs. Going straight to the source is really how I was able to overcome some of those pitfalls. And so I want people to hear my story and know that you can actually go from being a democratic socialist to a Trump supporter, but you have to look deeper. I think there's a political realignment that's taking place. I've always been very anti-war, and now Trump is by a mile the anti-war candidate. I've always been very much for free speech. Trump is now by a mile the more pro-free speech candidate. What's at stake in November is pretty much everywhere you look. You either see prosperity and liberty and things that you want to preserve, or if you're a Democrat, everywhere you look, you see something you want to tear down and remake in the image of some other country that's not as successful as we are. I'm trying to conserve our values, our constitution, our God-given rights, right to bear arms, freedom of speech, all the things that has always made this country great. You know, it took me a good long time to get here, but I hope that Trump wins and that we can continue with the progress that he's made and the policies that he's put into place. Let's get our economy back on track and let's be moving in the right direction. Good evening. My name is Jeff Van Drew. I speak to you as a member of the Republican Party. But it always wasn't that way. How I became a Republican says a lot about today's Democratic Party. I'm from South Jersey, where we work hard, look after our neighbors, and care about our communities. Years ago, I was a local dentist and was asked by the Democrats to run for a town council seat. I had my doubts, and I explained that my views were middle of the road to conservative, but the local leaders said the Democratic Party was a big tent and that they accepted people like me. I was elected to council as a Democrat. But as I won seats for county office, state legislature, and then Congress, I noticed things were changing. The Democratic Party had become less accepting of American tradition, less believing in American exceptionalism, less supportive of traditional faith and family. This was not the party that I knew. In 2018, after being elected to Congress as a Democrat, I was already uncomfortable with a San Francisco liberal running the House which is why my first vote in Congress was cast against Nancy Pelosi for Speaker. But imagine how I felt after seeing members of the squad quickly take control of the Democratic Party just weeks after being elected. The party had moved from liberal to radical. This new Democratic Party wasn't just for higher taxes. Now they were for open borders, against our police, and against our God-given rights. When the radical Democrats went after President Trump with impeachment, they made another mistake. Democratic leaders told me that I had to vote for impeachment or my life would be made difficult and I wouldn't be allowed to run again. Listen, I'm from South Jersey, and you better come at me with more than just loud words and empty threats. I voted no on impeachment and it was an easy call. Soon after, I met with President Trump, and he made me feel more comfortable and welcome in the Oval Office than Nancy Pelosi ever made me feel in her caucus. And a few days later, I officially changed parties, and I became a Republican. Let me tell you about Joe Biden. When the Democrats tried to order me around, I was ready, willing, and able to say, I've had enough with their radical socialist agenda. Do you really believe Joe Biden is ready, willing, and most of all, able to do the same? As Joe says, come on, man. Joe Biden is being told what to do by the radicals running my former party, the same radicals trying to install him as their puppet president. 
When I'm at my local diner, I tell people that America is the best nation in the world and that President Trump has helped make it that way. Republicans, independents, and even Democrats, they all know that in President Trump's America, we have a strong military, strong support for our police, strong support for our veterans, and strong support for our seniors. In President Trump's America, we have a strong supply chain, good schools, we're energy independent, and we protect our environment. There are a lot of Democrats who support our president and are disgusted for what their old party, what my old party, has become. Here's my advice. Be true to who you are now, not who the Democrats used to be. That's why I'm a proud Republican and why I will be voting for Donald Trump. Thank you, and may God bless you, God bless our president, and God bless the United States of America. For me, the most important issue is jobs. We need to be able to pay our bills. I trust Donald Trump on jobs way more than I do Joe Biden. There's no doubt that Donald Trump has built the strongest economy we've ever seen, and I know that he will do it again. Joe Biden doesn't have the energy, and his ideas like raising taxes, it's gonna hurt us. Electing Joe Biden as the president is a huge risk, and I don't want the future of my son in the hands of Joe Biden. I want my son to be able to go out and get a good education. I want the economy to be strong. I want the country that he lives in to be safe, and I want our borders to be secure, and I don't want that in Joe Biden's hands. Donald Trump has built the strongest economy we've ever seen. He has made our country safe. And as a mom, those are things that I'm very proud of. And those are things that are very important to me when I'm looking for a president. I'm sticking with Donald Trump. My name is Stacia Brightman. I'm a single mother of two boys, and I work in Houston, Texas, for s and Engineers and Constructors as a warehouse receiving clerk. After serving my country in the Marine Corps, I worked various jobs, but I thought I needed a degree in order to, in order to have a career. I put myself into significant debt to earn my bachelor's degree in finance. Despite my degree and all of my efforts, at one point, my boys and I even found ourselves homeless. After being laid off yet again, I received an email from the Texas Workforce Commission about SMB's Women in Construction Earn While You Learn apprenticeship program. I thought I'd give it a try. I was a bit skeptical at first, but I said to myself, hey, if they're willing to take a chance on me, I should be willing to take a chance on myself. At the start of the program, I was making $16 an hour while I trained to become a pipe fitter helper. Looking back, it wasn't easy, but boy, was it worth it. I felt empowered that I was learning new skills and able to support my family again. I worked hard, got promoted, and even got a few raises. Later, I learned what President Donald Trump and Ivanka Trump were doing behind the scenes to make sure that people like me and you had a chance to rise up and succeed. President Trump started the National Council for the American Worker and the American Workforce Policy Advisory Board. Together with Ivanka, he wrote policies that made it easy for states and companies to give opportunities to hardworking Americans like me. The President and Ivanka also partnered with the Ag Council to launch FindSomethingNew.org, helping to connect workers, and tra workers with training and apprenticeship programs where they live. If you find yourself in a situation like mine, where you feel you have nowhere to turn, nothing to really fall back on, and you feel like no one believes in you, go online to FindSomethingNew.org and see that President Trump believes in you. And more importantly, please believe in yourself. Keep trying, keep pushing. Times will get hard. Remember, just a few years ago, I was homeless. And you know what now? I'm set to close on a brand new home at the end of the month. So my message to you is keep pushing. You can do it. Find a training program like the one I participated in. And like me, you have an opportunity to build a career in life that you're proud of. So with that being said, I'd like to talk to you about a different kind of training. This is the Trump campaign's National Week of Volunteer Training. If you're like me, you know how important it is to put Americans back to work. 
So get trained and get involved with the campaign. Go online to www.trumpvictory.com and sign up and keep the president fighting for you for another four years. Thank you and God bless. My name is Dan Scavino. When I was 16 years old, I got a part-time job at a golf course just outside of New York City. One day, I was cleaning golf clubs when a man pulled into the parking lot. There wasn't a single person who didn't know who it was. Everyone's jaws were on the ground. It was Donald Trump. All I could think was, nobody will ever believe this at school tomorrow. I never would have imagined it at this moment, but I've now been at President Trump's side for almost 30 years. All these years later, there's a part of me that still feels a sense of wonder every day when I consider the journey we have taken together and taken with so many of you watching tonight. Because my personal story with Donald Trump, in so many ways, is yours too. He saw potential in me, a spark, the possibility that I could be more, do more, and achieve more than even I thought was possible. That's how he views this country, too. We have all just scratched the surface of what we can do together. If there's one thing I hope you will hear from me tonight, it is this. President Trump is a kind and decent man. I wish you could be at his side with me to see his endless kindness to everyone he meets. The media could be a fog machine, creating a partisan mist around everything that's hard to see through. But in 2016, you navigated through it all. You found your way through the swamp, and you arrived safely on the other side with Donald J. Trump as your new president. There are some things that were true then, reasons why you choose him as your country's leader, that remain true today. You know the president cannot be bought. The American people must know their president isn't building his life. He's building yours. He knows the president cannot be bullied. President Trump is the first leader who's been too strong, too tough, and too savvy to be crushed by the status quo establishment and the political media class. You know the president cannot be beaten. He's got a fighting spirit, like so many of you do. And winning for America is what he does. While they call it chaos, President Trump calls it change. Just think about what we achieved together with President Trump. The strongest economy in history, the lowest unemployment rate for almost all demographic groups, black Americans, Hispanic Americans, women, and so many more. He did that once and he will do it again. You know it, and I know it. We all just need somebody to believe in our capacity to do great things. Donald Trump believed in me when I was a teenage golf caddy, and he was already one of the wealthiest, most famous people on the entire planet. He saw my potential, even when I couldn't. He sees greatness in our country too, and in each of you. He believes the world you dream about at night can be yours. He truly is a man of the people. Just think about what he has done with this convention. You've heard from real Americans with real stories. People who are just like us. People whose lives have been forever impacted by the president and his policies. You've heard from people like John Peterson, who has a factory in Ohio. Tanya Weinreich, who has a small business in Montana. Jason Joyce, a fisherman from Maine. And Chris Peterson, a dairy farmer from Wisconsin. You've seen a man who turned his life around get a second chance with a presidential pardon. You've seen brand new Americans become our fellow citizens in a ceremony at the White House. 
You felt the passion of pro-life and religious freedom advocates and listened to the heartfelt words of a man whose family fled communism and oppression. Who needs a nonstop parade of politicians when you got an army of the people behind you? On November 3rd, vote for the man who believes in America and believes in you. Vote for my friend, your friend, our friend, Donald J. Trump. Thank you, and God bless the United States of America. Good evening. It's an honor to come before you tonight from the Commonwealth of Kentucky. As the only leader in Washington not from either New York or California, I consider it my responsibility to look out for middle America. This election is incredibly consequential for middle America. President Trump knows he inherited the first generation of Americans who couldn't promise their children a better life than their own. He's made it his mission of this administration to change that. I know because I work beside him every day. Today's Democrat Party doesn't want to improve life for middle America. They prefer that all of us in flyover country keep quiet and let them decide how we should live our lives. They want to tell you when you can go to work, when your kids can go to school. They want to tax your job out of existence and then send you a government check for unemployment. They want to tell you what kind of car you can drive, what sources of information are credible, and even how many hamburgers you can eat. They want to defund the police and take away your Second Amendment rights. They want free health care for illegal immigrants, yet they offer no protection at all for unborn Americans. They want to pack the Supreme Court with liberals intent on eroding our constitutional rights. And they want to codify all this by making the swamp itself, Washington, D.C., America's 51st state. With two more liberal senators, we cannot undo the damage they've done. Now you understand why Democrats spent an entire week telling us about who Joe Biden is, not what he intends to do. I'm immensely proud of the work the Republican Senate has done. We are the firewall against Nancy Pelosi's agenda. Like President Trump, we won't be bullied by a liberal media intent on destroying America's institutions. We will stand our post on behalf of the millions of Americans whose stories aren't told in today's newspapers, whose struggles are just as real. We'll continue to support American families as we defeat the coronavirus and return our economy to the envy of the world. The stakes have never been higher, which is why I'm asking you to support Republican Senate candidates across the country and reelect my friend, President Donald Trump. <laughs> Titans of American sport know that many of life's most valuable lessons are learned on the field of competition and the ability to overcome adversity. But I might have been given a bad break, but I've got a neck of luck to look for. And your relentless will to win, win, win. These qualities embody the American spirit of pushing boundaries, defying limits. It's a game cast in sports immortality. And always striving for greatness. You stayed in the fight. You finished the fight. Often bumpy roads lead to beautiful places. This great building is celebrating great people. And your winners all. Would you please rise for the playing of our national anthem. It's our honor to be in the company of great, great champions. Team USA will indeed take home the gold. We have to get our sports back. We can't wait to see what's next. Never give up, never lose faith, never ever quit. Just keep forging ahead to give everything you've got. Victory is always within reach. Hey everyone, I am Dana White, the president of the UFC. Many of you know who I am, what I do, and that I am friends with the president. 
I spoke at this convention four years ago, and I'm back because I believe we need President Trump's leadership now more than ever. Before the pandemic, President Trump built the greatest economy in our nation's history and created opportunities for all Americans like no one before him. Financial markets hit all-time highs, unemployment was at an all-time low, and we weren't facing the lawless destruction that now is occurring in a few of our great cities. It blows my mind how quickly some of the leadership in this country has forgotten the critical role first responders play in our society. Police departments and other law enforcement, even some fire departments, have faced opposition from many in this country but they are always the people who are asked to step up when things are at their worst and put themselves at risk. That has certainly been the case during this ongoing pandemic. Come on, America, defunding these vital positions is not the answer. The first responders have always taken care of us, and now, more than ever, we need to take care of them. Now, let's talk about COVID, and let's be very honest about it. No one person and no one place could have anticipated the challenges that COVID would bring. But President Trump has faced all these obstacles head on. He immediately put protective measures in place and he reached out to the best and the brightest leading American businesses across all industries to discuss what he and his administration could do to get the economy back up and running safely. Let me give you more detail. In early April, President Trump organized a task force of business leaders across the country, and I was fortunate enough to serve on that task force. Firsthand, I had the opportunity to witness how hardworking and determined President Trump was to solve unprecedented problems our country was facing. I personally observed his ability to listen and understand the issues impacting Americans of all backgrounds. It was clear. His highest priority was always the health and safety of everyone in our country. Not just Republicans, not just supporters, but every single American. President Trump recognized that one of the small ways to instill a sense of normalcy in people's lives was to bring back entertainment options. The president went above and beyond to help all sports leagues involved figure out a way to overcome the challenges of staging live professional sporting events in the middle of a pandemic. And you know what? We did it. The UFC was the first to do it, and we are continuing to do it. Now, other sports have joined us, and some of the lessons learned are being used to help reopen other types of businesses and schools. Make no mistake about it. We still have a long way to go, and that is why we need a leader with President Trump's unique attributes at this critical time. I have said it before, and I will say it again. He is one of the most loyal human beings I have ever met. The man has unstoppable energy. No one, and I mean no one, is gonna outwork this guy. But most importantly, he truly loves and believes in our country. He believes in the people of this country. America is a place everyone wants a solid job. They want to take care of their family. They want to support the community, assist the less fortunate, and enjoy the freedom this country has provided to all of us. While we have certainly experienced a ton of negativity in 2020, President Trump's mindset is to work tirelessly to find solutions to problems and help restore America. He did it once, and I'm telling you right now, he will do it again. And remember, President Trump may be the only president in modern times who has actually done everything he said he would do during his campaign. There's this quote that I love from Ronald Reagan, where he said, there isn't any problem we can't solve if government will give us the facts, tell us what needs to be done, then get out of the way and let us have at it. And what that means to me is, as Americans, we work hard to overcome adversity, and we face the tough times head on, irrespective of your gender, race, religion, or sexual orientation. What unites us as a nation is freedom, equality, and opportunity. That's what it means to be an American. Ladies and gentlemen, Let's reelect President Trump. Let's figure out what the problems are and continue to find solutions to those problems. Then let's get to work.
I'd like to close with this. While it's critically important to reelect President Trump, this pandemic has also taught us to be very, very careful who you select as your next governor, senator, congressperson, and mayor. It is so important to vote. And don't think that your vote doesn't matter, because to be honest with you, it has never mattered more than it does right now. Thank you, and have a great evening, America. Buenas tardes. Konbanwa. Magandang gabi po. Aloha and good evening. I'm Utah Attorney General Sean Reyes. I'm a proud American and proud descendant of warrior ancestors, women and men alike, from my Hawaiian, Filipino, Japanese, and Spanish heritage. My father demonstrated his warrior spirit over 50 years ago, fighting a dictator in his homeland, the Philippines. Barely escaping with his life, he started anew in America. He arrived with nothing but faith, determination, and a willingness to work hard. He lived the American dream, building businesses, a family, and seeing me become Utah's first minority statewide elected official. Today, I channel my warrior roots by battling human trafficking. I've been able to lead some of the largest trafficking prosecutions in America and traveled to foreign countries, working with law enforcement and NGOs to dismantle trafficking networks and rescue people from the most brutal conditions imaginable. Young girls and women sold into sex slavery, young boys and men forced into labor servitude, illegal adoptions, organ harvesting, human life utterly debased. President Donald Trump is a fierce warrior against human trafficking. How do I know? Early in 2017, I had occasion to visit with him about our rescues. He asked insightful questions, expressed deep concern for victims. Overwhelmed with compassion, he promised to attack this evil. President Trump summoned Ivanka and leaders from his cabinet directing resources and hundreds of millions of dollars for raising awareness, liberating victims, prosecuting predators, and empowering survivors. Together, they've done more to combat human trafficking than any administration in modern history. Now that's a promise kept. President Trump's taken similar aggressive action to break the chains of drug addiction and improve mental and behavioral health. He declared the opioid epidemic a national public health emergency and made available billions of dollars to confront this threat. He also signed a bill creating a phone number like 911, but for mental health. When activated, 988 will be a lifeline for those struggling with thoughts of suicide, depression, addiction, self-harm, or even hurting others. It will save countless American lives. A few months ago, my father, my warrior hero, lost his fight with cancer. When he passed, he had by his bedside his scriptures, family photos, and a pen President Trump gave me to give him. Dad loved that pen. It represented freedom to him, the freedom that only exists when someone is willing to fight for it. To my father, President Trump is that ultimate warrior fighting for our freedom. If you listen to Democrats, the media, and liberal elite, they will tell you that America's light doesn't shine as brightly around the world as it once did. That is simply not true. The same light that brought my father to America inspires the desperate and downtrodden equally today. Believe me, I interact with some of the most marginalized victims on earth, and they love America. They love President Trump because he's fighting for their freedom and America's freedom. Thank you, President Trump. God bless you, and God bless America, this land of greatness.
My name is Debbie Flood, and I own a small foundry and machine shop in Wisconsin that manufactures cast bronze architectural hardware. My father, who was a World War II veteran, started the business with some used equipment and the American dream. Today, we are one of the only U.S. companies left who make our products from start to finish under one roof. We really make things, and we love it. When we lost nearly 50% of our business to China in the mid-2000s, we wondered how a small company like ours could continue to compete. At that time, Joe Biden was a senator. He voted to normalize trade with China and help pave the way for them to join the WTO, even though they were hurting American companies like ours. But we're tenacious and we're creative. We took a risk and purchased a 3D printer. 3D printing technology allows us to do things that China can't. Now we can take a customer's idea from sketch to sample to production in just a few weeks. This opened up new opportunities for us. Later, we fought our way through the Great Recession. Then Donald Trump was elected and we breathed a sigh of relief. He actually fought for American workers and American craftsmen. He actually cared about bringing back those three beautiful words, made in America. We no longer had to succeed despite government. Now the government was on our side. We enjoyed a thriving economy stimulated by President Trump's pro-business and pro-worker policies. Thanks to the Trump tax cuts, I've been able to raise my employees' wages, so they got a pay raise and a tax cut. Even in the face of the pandemic, the president doubled down on his support for business. Thanks to President Trump, our business was approved for the Paycheck Protection Program. That allowed us to keep our people working at a time when the future was very uncertain. Our president understands that the best solutions unleash the innovation of American entrepreneurs and the creativity of American workers. Joe Biden doesn't really know anything about business or creating jobs. He spent 47 years in government, and it's doubtful that he'll finally figure it out in year 48. He's pledged to raise our taxes and bring back excessive regulation. I own a business whose mission it is to solve problems. Anything can be solved with a little creativity. It takes courage, commitment, and ideas. And those are all things that come naturally to President Trump, and that's why he has my support. My name is Judy Smith. My name is Manuel Martinez. My name is Claudia Perez. I live in um, New York City public housing. I'm the resident council president for South Jamaica Houses. I am resident council president of Washington Houses, which is in Spanish Harlem. My name is Carmen Quinones, and I'm the president of Douglas Houses, 3,500 strong residents here. And I am a lifelong Democrat. I would really hate to get started on this mayor. Bill de Blasio and the way he has dealt with public housing residents is disgraceful. This mayor has made our lives here in I think every housing development very uncomfortable. Under the Trump administration, New York City Housing Authority has received an influx of cash that it has not seen since 1997. I'm grateful for the spotlight that President Trump is putting on New York City public housing. I think it's wrong that the Democrats put illegal immigrants before black Americans. How is it that we have people waiting on the waiting list for New York City public housing for 10 years or more, but yet we have illegal immigrants living here? Something is wrong with that picture. Since HUD came in with Lynn Patton as the regional director for HUD, it helped us identify some long systemic problems that we are now putting on the table and having discussions on. President Trump's administration have opened their ear and have listened 
there's been improvement in public housing. We're very appreciative of this administration that has come and finally shined a light on what's going on and bringing real solutions to a real problem. Hello, my name is Ann Dorn. I'd like to introduce you to my husband, David, father of five, brother of 12, grandfather of 10, friend to thousands. He was the most kind, dedicated, loving life partner I could have hoped for. He had a big smile and a heart to match. He was blessed with the gift of gab, and that gift enabled him to touch souls and inspire people especially young people. Oh, how kids loved him, and they really loved him back. Dave was all about service. He served 38 years in the St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department and six years as chief of police as the Moline Acres Police Department. After 44 years, he retired from law enforcement, but he never retired from helping a friend in need. Since he befriended every person he met, he was a very busy man. One example of that was his friendship with a young man named Lee. David met him when Lee was just a kid after members of his family were attacked and murdered. Dave took a special interest in the boy. They bonded and their friendship grew and remained strong throughout the years. Lee eventually opened a pawn shop. He trusted Dave implicitly and asked Dave to help with security. David readily agreed. Whenever the shop's alarm would go off, the alarm company called Dave. He would investigate. If he got a call after I went to bed, he would wake me up and tell me he was going to Lee's, just to make sure everything was all right. Most of the time, they were false alarms, triggered by a storm or animals. But I never rested easily until I heard Dave's key turn in the door, knowing he was home safe. The alarm that went off the morning of June 2nd was for real. It was a violent night in St. Louis. Four officers were shot. Others were hit with rocks and fireworks. At least five businesses were damaged, looted, or set on fire. As the officer wellness coordinator and CIT coordinator with the police department, I was keenly aware of their rioting and spent the evening getting ready to mobilize support for officers who were impacted. After I'd gone to bed, David received a call from Lee's alarm company. The front door of the pawn shop had been breached. This time, he didn't wake me up to tell me. He probably knew I would have tried to stop him or insist on going with him. As I slept, looters were ransacking the shop they shot and killed David in cold blood and then live streamed his execution and his last moments on earth. David's grandson was watching the video on Facebook in real time, not realizing he was watching his own grandfather dying on the sidewalk. I learned of all this around 4 a.m. when our doorbell rang. The chief of police was standing outside. I wondered why Dave had not answered the door. It wasn't uncommon for him to be up watching TV at this time. I called out to him several times. There was no reply. He just wasn't there. I let in the chief, and fighting back tears, he uttered the words, every officer's spouse dreads. <sighs> I relive that horror in my mind every single day. My hope is that having you relive it with me now will help shake this country from this nightmare we are witnessing in our cities and bring about positive, peaceful change. How do we get to this point where so many young people are callous and indifferent towards human life? This isn't a video game where you can commit mayhem and then just hit reset and bring all the characters back to life. 
Dave is never, never coming back to me. He was murdered by people who didn't know and just didn't care. He would have done anything to help them. Violence and destruction are not legitimate forms of protest. They do not safeguard black lives. They only destroy them. President Trump understands this, has offered federal help to restore order in our communities. In a time when police departments are short on resources and manpower, we need that help. We should accept that help. We must heal before we can affect change. But we cannot heal amid devastation and chaos. President Trump knows we need more Davids in our communities, not fewer. We need to come together in peace and remember that every life is precious. Good evening. I'm Ben Carson, a retired neurosurgeon and a public servant. Before I begin, I'd like to say that our hearts go out to the Blake family and the other families who've been impacted by the tragic events in Kenosha. As Jacob's mother has urged the country, let's use our hearts, our love, and our intelligence to work together to show the rest of the world how humans are supposed to treat each other. America is great when we behave greatly. In order to succeed and change, we must first come together in love of our fellow citizens. History reminds us that necessary change comes through hope and love, not senseless and destructive violence. Abraham Lincoln once said to an America divided that, quote, your purpose then, plainly stated, is that you will destroy the government unless you be allowed to construe and enforce the Constitution as you please on all points in dispute between you and us. You will rule or ruin in all events." Unquote. These words of warning are relevant today. We have a choice. Do we want big government that controls our lives from cradle to grave? Or do we believe in the power and wisdom of the people and their ability to self-govern with help from a limited federal government? Our president, Donald J. Trump, believes in the people. He is one of us. He makes promises and he keeps them. He is transparent and we certainly know what he's thinking. He does not submit to political correctness or to its enforcers, the media. He is real. Right now, we need real. We need courage. We can't cower in the corner and hope that no one calls us a name, believing that will keep us safe. That is not courage, and that will not lead us to a good and just place. We must remember all those who sacrificed everything in order to give us freedom. And we must be willing to do the same for those who come after us. President Trump does not dabble in identity politics. He wants everyone to succeed and believes in the adage, a rising tide lifts all boats. Many on the other side love to incite division by claiming that President Trump is a racist. They could not be more wrong. Years ago, Jesse Jackson gave Donald Trump an award for the economic opportunities he created for black people. In Palm Beach, Florida, Donald Trump led the crusade to allow blacks and Jews into private clubs and resorts. One of the first things he did as president was bring the Office of Historically Black Colleges and Universities into the White House so that it could get proper attention and financial support. Before the pandemic, African-American unemployment was at an all-time low. President Trump accomplished prison reform. He created incentives to encourage investors to become involved with economically deprived areas of America. He strongly supports school choice 
fully recognizing that no matter what circumstances a person is born into, they can achieve success with a good education. It was true for me. When my mother forced me to read books about doctors, entrepreneurs, inventors, and scientists, I began to recognize that the person who has the most to do with what happens to you in life is you. My mother always told me, Ben, you can do anything, but I will never allow you to become a victim. It was then that I stopped listening to the people who were trying to convince me that I was a victim and that others were responsible for my victimhood. What is racist is the fact that African Americans have the highest abortion rate. President Trump is the most pro-life president in the country's history. He will continue to fight for those who cannot yet speak. The vision of a shining city up on a hill came from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. America is that shiny city. We are the beacon of hope for the world. At this moment in time, President Donald Trump is the man with the courage, the vision, and the ability to keep it shining brightly. Lynch, president of the Police Benevolence Association, speaking to you on behalf of 50,000 active and retired New York City police officers. We are the proud men and women who wear a shield on our chest and put ourselves in harm's way to protect our city. We are proud to endorse our president, Donald J. Trump, for re-election because the stakes have never been higher. Like cops across the country, we are staring down the barrel of a public safety disaster. More than 1,000 people have been shot in New York City so far this year. Almost 300 have been killed. These are not just numbers, these are real people. A father gunned down while holding his seven-year-old daughter's hand. A beloved neighborhood peacemaker killed by a stray bullet. A 17-year-old who made all the right choices, who worked hard to go to college and earned a sports scholarship murdered before he can tell his mother the news. A one-year-old child shot dead in his stroller. Innocent people, innocent lives lost. One tragedy is too many. But every day, the number keeps growing. And every day, our communities are asking us, why is this happening? The answer is simple. The Democrats have walked away from us. They have walked away from police officers, and they've walked away from the innocent people we protect. Democratic politicians have surrendered our streets and our institutions. The loudest voices have taken control, and our so-called leaders are scrambling to catch up with them. In city after city, they've slashed police budgets. They have hijacked and dismantled the criminal justice system. They've passed laws that made it impossible for police officers to do our job effectively. Here's the sad truth that every cop in this country knows. The violence and chaos we're seeing now isn't a side effect. It isn't an unintended consequence. It's actually the goal. The radical left doesn't really want better policing. They don't really care about making the justice system fairer. What they want is no policing. What they want is a justice system that just stops working altogether. In places where Democrats are in power, the radical left is getting exactly what they want, and our country is suffering for it. I've been a New York City police officer for 36 years. I've spent 21 of those years protecting the cops who protect New Yorkers. I've never seen our streets go this bad so quickly. I've never heard from so many cops from every corner of the country who are saying the same thing. Our hands are tied. If we're going to turn the tide and restore law and order, we cannot fall into the left's trap. There is nobody who hates bad cops more than good cops. But that doesn't matter to the radical left. To them, we're all just bad because we're all just blue. Their anti-law enforcement campaign isn't about a single incident. It isn't the result of one bad law or one bad policy. It's about a message. The message is police officers are the enemy. The message is criminals have the right to resist arrest. The message is if you commit a crime, if you victimize the most vulnerable of people, the justice system will not hold you accountable. That's the message echoing through city halls and state houses across our country. It's playing on a loop in the media. The criminals have heard that message, and they're taking full advantage. We must stop that message. 
We must expose the left's lies about police officers and the job that we do. And we will do that because we have something that they don't. We have a real leader. We have a powerful voice in the most powerful office in our country. We have President Donald J. Trump. Unlike the Democrats who are running in fear of the mob in the street, President Trump has never apologized for supporting police officers and standing up for law and order. Unlike the Democrats who froze in the face of rioting and looting, President Trump matches his words with his actions. He gives law enforcement the support and the tools we need to go out there and put a stop to it, period. End of story. It has never been harder to be a police officer in this country, but there are two things that keep us going. We look at the victims, the vulnerable, the regular working people who count on us. We keep strapping on our duty belts and bullet-resistant vests because we know we can't let them down. And while we do that, we hear the words of our president, who says to police officers everywhere, I will never let you down. We know that he hasn't, and we know that he won't. We've been fortunate to have him in office these past four years, and we know that we cannot afford to lose him. When it comes to your safety, your family's safety, and the safety of all Americans, there's no other choice. You won't be safe in Joe Biden's America. We can have four more years of President Trump, or you can have no safety, no justice, and no peace. Good evening. My name is Rudy Giuliani, and I'm the former mayor of New York City. In 2013, my city elected a self-described progressive Democrat as mayor. New York City, once described as America's crime capital, had become, by the mid-1990s, America's safest large city. Now, today, my city is in shock. Murders, shootings, and violent crime are increasing at percentages unheard of in the past. We're seeing the return of rioting and looting. During riots, this Democrat mayor, like others, has often prevented the police from making arrests. And even when arrests are made, liberal, progressive DAs release the rioters so as not to disrupt the rioting. New Yorkers wonder, how did we get overwhelmed by crime so quickly and declined so fast? Don't let Democrats do to America what they have done to New York. Again, the Democrats are urging you to vote for an obviously defective candidate. Biden has changed his principles so often, he no longer has any principles. He's a Trojan horse with Bernie, AOC, Pelosi, Black Lives Matter, and his party's entire left wing just waiting to execute their pro-criminal, anti-police, socialist policies. The whole unprecedented wave of lawlessness began with a truly just cause, the unforgivable police killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis. Peaceful protests began all over the land. The condemnation of the killing was universal, from President Trump to Democrat leaders. It seemed, for a few brief shining moments, Democrat and Republican leaders would come together with a unified proposal to reduce police misconduct. This possibility was very dangerous to the left. They had a president to beat and a country to destroy. And although an agreement on action against police brutality would be very valuable for the country, it would also make President Trump appear to be an effective leader. They could have none of that. So Black Lives Matter and Antifa sprang into action, and in a flash, they hijacked the peaceful protests into vicious, brutal riots. Soon, protests turned into riots in many other American cities, almost all Democrat. Businesses were burned and crushed, people beaten, shot and killed, police officers routinely assaulted, badly beaten, and occasionally murdered and the police handcuffed by progressive Democrat mayors from doing anything but observe the crimes and absorb the blows. But the worst of it was the slaughter of innocent young people with their whole lives ahead of them. The murder of four-year-old Grand Talfero in Kansas City 
shock the nation, but not Black Lives Matter, or their many Democrat supporters, 17-year-old basketball star Brandon Hendricks was killed in the Bronx just days after graduating high school and on his way to St. John's to play basketball. He passed with only a brief mention. One-year-old Davil Gardner Jr. was shot and killed in a stroller at a cookout in Brooklyn, and it caused no outrage. For President Trump and for us Republicans, all black lives matter, and the lives of LeGrand and Brandon and Davil matter to us. All lives matter to us. These continuous riots in Democratic cities gives you a good view of the future under Biden. All five of the top cities for homicides, like the top cities for rioting and looting, are governed by progressive Democrats. Using the progressive Democrat approach to crime, which is to do nothing, substantive to reduce it, to release prisoners as many and as soon as possible, and to go to war with the police, the only group with the capability to protect your citizens. It is clear that a vote for Biden and the Democrats creates the risk that you will bring this lawlessness to your city, to your town, to your suburb. There is no question that this awesome job of restoring safety for our people cannot be done from your basement, Joe. There's also no question that President Trump will fight with all his strength to preserve the American system of government and our way of life. In critical times in our history, America has always been blessed with the right person to handle the crisis. Washington, Lincoln, Roosevelt, Reagan were perfect for the challenges they faced and brought our nation through gloriously. President Trump, with his boundless love of our country and all our people, his disciplined work ethic, his exceptional ability to inspire, and his deep understanding of our system of government and the strength of American values is the man we can trust to preserve and even improve our way of life. Mr. President, make our nation safe again. The U.S. attorney announced charges against Dr. Charles Lieber and two Chinese nationals today. A systematic decision by many of our country's most powerful leaders to sell out America to China. China is going to eat our lunch? Come on, man. A 2013 trip to China getting new attention this morning, not for what Joe Biden did, but for who he brought with him. As the threat from China grew larger and more threatening, Biden seemed to grow more accommodating to the Chinese government. Questions about money he made from foreign business dealings while his father was vice president. And they knew they could get to Joe Biden's heart through his son, Hunter Biden. They hoped to raise $1.5 billion. One person who did not want to talk about it, Joe Biden. When it was already clear China had lied to the world in ways that hurt the world about a deadly outbreak of the Wuhan coronavirus, Biden was still flacking for the Chinese government. I, you know, they're not bad folks, folks. But guess what? They're not a they're, they're not, they're not competition for us. China would prefer for Biden. I'm Senator Tom Cotton. A lot's changed in four years. Back then, we gathered in a rowdy arena. Tonight, you're probably at home, while I stand alone. Stand alone. That was the motto of my old Army unit, the 506th Infantry, the original band of brothers. From the Normandy beaches to the Iraqi desert, we fought alongside each other, but we were always prepared to stand alone. And so it is with our nation. We lead the free world, 
but we'll stand alone if we must to defend America. Donald Trump understands this. He puts America first. That's why America is safer now than four years ago. But Joe Biden would return us to a weak and dangerous past. Barack Obama's own Secretary of Defense said Joe Biden has been wrong on nearly every major national security decision over the past four decades. So let's compare the records of Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Joe Biden slashed defense spending again and again. President Trump rebuilt our military and added the Space Force. Joe Biden let ISIS terrorists rampage across the Middle East. President Trump eliminated ISIS's leader and destroyed its caliphate. Joe Biden opposed the mission to kill Osama bin Laden. President Trump avenged the murder of hundreds of Americans by killing Iran's terrorist mastermind, Qasem Soleimani. Joe Biden sent pallets of cash to the Ayatollahs. President Trump ripped up the dangerous Iran nuclear deal. Joe Biden treated Israel like a nuisance. President Trump moved our embassy to Jerusalem and brokered peace deals in the Middle East. Joe Biden coddled socialist dictators in Cuba and Venezuela. President Trump fights against communism in America's backyard and around the world. And on the Communist Party of China, there is no comparison. Joe Biden aided and abetted China's rise for 50 years with terrible trade deals that closed our factories and laid off our workers. President Trump stands up to China's cheating and stealing and lying. Joe Biden allowed Chinese fentanyl to flood across our southern border. President Trump sanctioned Chinese drug dealers for poisoning our kids. Joe Biden said Chinese communists aren't even our competitor, aren't bad folks. Just months before they unleashed this plague on the world, President Trump is clear-eyed about the Chinese threat and he is making China pay. But China's not giving up. In fact, they're rooting for Joe Biden. America's other enemies won't give up either. But Joe Biden would be as wrong and weak over the next four years as he has been for the last 50. We need a president who stands up for America, not one who takes a knee. A strong and proud America is a safe America, safe from our enemies and safe from war. No one who's seen the face of war desires to see it again. Too many of our fellow Americans are already honored at the hallowed grounds of Arlington. But if we want peace, we must be strong. Weakness is provocative. President Trump's strength has kept us out of war. Joe Biden won't stand up for America. Donald Trump will. So this November, let's stand with the president and vote to keep America great. is Marsha Mueller. This is my husband, Carl. Our daughter, Kayla, was taken as a hostage and murdered by ISIS. From a young age, Kayla was amazing. She taught herself languages, how to write music, how to play guitar. She worked with troubled youth, military veterans, and Native Americans. Everywhere Kayla went, people smiled. Kayla had a gift to be able to see the world through someone else's eyes. She became a humanitarian aid worker, and when she was helping children at an orphanage in India, Kayla wrote, I find God in the suffering eyes reflected in mine. If this is how you are revealed to me, this is how I will forever seek you. She went to Turkey to help Syrian refugees in 2012. In August 2013, she was asked by another aid worker to cross the border into Syria to help at a hospital. On August 4, 2013, ISIS terrorists stopped her vehicle and took her captive. 
Fela was mostly held in a 12 by 12 cell in solitary confinement. It was cold and dirty. ISIS terrorists shined bright lights in her face. They shaved her head. They beat her and tortured her. The leader of ISIS, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, raped her repeatedly. For 18 months, she endured. And we endured an agonizing back and forth between us, the Obama administration, and ISIS. We put all our faith in the government, but the government let us down. President Obama refused to meet with us until ISIS had already beheaded other Americans. To this day, we've never heard from Joe Biden. Instead, the Obama administration had hid behind policy so much that we felt hopeless when they kept us from negotiating to save Kayla's life. The administration showed more concern for the terrorists in Guantanamo than the American hostages in Syria. The military prepared a rescue mission, but the White House delayed it. By the time it went forward, Kayla had been moved to another location. After 18 months of brutal torture, we learned from ISIS that Kayla had been killed. The Obama administration kept telling us they were doing everything they could, but their version of everything wasn't enough. What a difference a president makes. Under President Trump, U.S. Army Special Operators conducted a raid on al-Baghdadi's compound. After we learned that al-Baghdadi was killed, we learned something else. The operators named themselves Task Force 814 after August 14th, Kayla's birthday. And the mission was named Operation Kayla Mueller. To those soldiers, thank you. Kayla was looking down on you. The Trump team gave us empathy we never received from the Obama administration. The Obama administration said it was doing everything it could. The Trump administration is. Let me just say this, Kayla should be here. If Donald Trump had been president when Kayla was captured, she would be here today. When Kayla was, was a hostage, I'd go outside at night and look at the moon. I'd look at the moon and I'd promise her I'd do everything I could to get her home. Now when I see the moon, I'm reminded of my promise to her I couldn't keep. All Kayla wanted was to make it home. We are still working to find her and God willing, we will bring her home. Kayla was born a miracle. We were told we would never have a second child, but God gave us Kayla and she gave herself to the world. Eight months into Kayla's captivity, another hostage was able to smuggle out a letter Kayla had written. As we read it, we could see that God was holding her in his arms. In her words, she felt tenderly cradled in free fall. She also wrote, I have been shown in darkness light and have learned that even in prison one can be free. I am grateful. I have had many hours to think how only in your absence have I finally at 25 years old come to realize your place in my life. None of us could have known it would be this long, but no, I am also fighting for my side in the ways I am able, and I have a lot of fight left inside of me. I am not breaking down, and I will not give in, no matter how long it takes. Kayla taught me so many things as her mom. She's still teaching us. Carl and I support Donald Trump because of his commitment to make and keep America great, not with the power of the government, but with the passion of people like Kayla, Americans who even in the darkest days always have more fight left inside of them, Americans who don't just talk, they act. That was our daughter. That's President Trump. As long as we stay strong like Kayla, as long as we refuse to break, we will be great. Thank you. I'm free to hug my family. I'm free to start over. This is the greatest day of my life. My heart is just bursting with gratitude. 
I want to thank President Donald John Trump. <laughs> Almost all people said that criminal justice reform would never pass. But we came together as a group, we worked across party lines, and we got it done. I'm an example of a woman who has been given a second chance in life. God bless you, and God bless America. Good evening. I'm Alice Marie Johnson. I was once told that the only way I would ever be reunited with my family would be as a corpse. But by the grace of God and the compassion of President Donald John Trump, I stand before you tonight and I assure you, I'm not a ghost. I am alive, I am well, and most importantly, I am free. In 1996, I began serving time in prison, life plus 25 years. I had never been in trouble. I was a first-time nonviolent offender. What I did was wrong. I made decisions that I regret. Some say, you do the crime, you do the time. However, that time should be fair and just. We've all made mistakes. None of us want to be defined forever based on our worst decision. While in prison, I became a playwright, a mentor, a certified hospice volunteer, an ordained minister, and received the Special Olympics Event Coordinator of the Year Award for my work with disabled women. Because the only thing worse than unjustly imprisoning my body is trying to imprison my mind. My transformation was described as extraordinary. Truth is, there are thousands of people just like me who deserve the opportunity to come home. I never stop fighting for my freedom. My Christian faith and the prayers of so many kept hope alive. When President Trump heard about me, about the injustice of my story, he saw me as a person. He had compassion and he acted. Free in body thanks to President Trump, but free in mind thanks to the almighty God. I couldn't believe it. I always remembered that God knew my name even in my darkest hour, but I never thought a president would. When I was released on June 6, 2018, I ran across that road and hugged my grandchildren for the first time. I'll never forget that feeling. And then I remembered the promise I had made to the men and women I left behind, that I would never stop fighting for them, and I haven't. I'm using my voice to tell their stories, and I pray that my face reminds you of those forgotten faces. Six months after President Trump granted me a second chance, he signed the First Step Act into law. It was real justice reform, and it brought joy, hope, and freedom to thousands of well-deserving people. I hollered, hallelujah! My faith in justice and mercy was rewarded. Imagine getting to hug your loved ones again and to think this first step meant so much to so many. I can't wait because we're just getting started. The nearly 22 years I spent in prison were not wasted. God had a purpose and a plan for my life. I was not delayed or denied. I was destined for such a time as this. I pray that you will not just hear this message, but that you will be inspired by my story and your compassion will lead you to take action for those who are forgotten. That's what our president, Donald Trump, did for me. And for that, I will be forever grateful.
God bless you. God bless President Trump. And God bless America. Thank you. It's one of the great American success stories. A builder who left his mark on skylines around the world. A businessman with an extraordinary ability to communicate directly with the American people. A leader who grew tired of politicians, leading our country down a road to ruin. He didn't do it for money or power or fame. He had all that. He did it because of his love for our great country. And we will make America great again. Donald J. Trump beat the odds, smashed the establishment, and won the presidency for the American people. Donald Trump has defeated Hillary Clinton to become president-elect. Hillary Clinton has called Donald Trump to concede the race. It has been a stunning night. It has been a historic night. Washington, D.C., the establishment is terrified, and they should be. They were all, all of them wrong, making this one of the greatest upsets in American political history. Immediately upon taking office, President Trump changed things. But change threatened the establishment, and the establishment fought back. Democrat obstruction, phony investigations, the dishonest media, an incredible 92% of stories are negative. No president has seen anything like it, despite everything they threw at him. President Trump delivered for the American people, and he delivered like never before. Building the strongest economy in American history, 7 million new jobs, the lowest ever unemployment for black and Hispanic Americans, ending the Biden era of lopsided trade deals that sent our factories overseas, passing the historic USMCA, taking on China, winning the trade war, protecting and strengthening Medicare and Social Security, lowering the cost of insulin, delivering the first real drop in drug prices in 50 years, restoring our military, fixing the VA, bringing our troops home, and taking the world's deadliest terrorists off the battlefield. Soleimani, al-Baghdadi, ISIS, brought to justice. Moving America's embassy to Jerusalem, a new era of strength and solidarity with our ally Israel. Negotiating a historic peace deal between Israel and the United Arab Emirates. Securing our border. Miles of new border wall being built. Illegal immigration dropped to the lowest point in a decade. Tackling the coronavirus head on. Banning travel from China. Mobilizing government, business, and the American people to manufacture masks, ventilators, and medical supplies. And launching Operation Warp Speed. An unprecedented effort to develop a vaccine to eradicate the coronavirus from the face of the earth in record time. President Trump has accomplished more for the American people in four years than any other president in history. And in his second term, he will lead America to even greater heights, draining the swamp, rebuilding the economy, bringing back millions of jobs, creating 10 million new jobs in 10 months, new opportunities for all Americans, not just those at the top, lowering drug costs, expanding access to high quality health care for every American. American family, defending America's police, restoring law and order to our cities, stopping illegal immigration and protecting American families, and ending America's reliance on China once and for all, bringing back jobs and factories, making medicine and products in America again. President Trump will rebuild America's infrastructure, renew hope and our entrepreneurial spirit for a new generation, and restore the American dream. It won't be easy, never pretty. The swamp will continue to fight him every step of the way. But under President Trump, our families will thrive. Our incomes will rise. Our communities will be kept safe. Our factories will flourish. Our flag will fly high. Our country will soar, and we will make America great again. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ivanka Trump. <laughs> Good 
evening. Before I begin, I want to send a special message to everyone who's been affected by Hurricane Laura. Our hearts are with you. The President will continue to support you every step of the way. And just like Americans always do, the nation will come together to help you rebuild your homes, businesses, and communities stronger and more resilient than ever before. Four years ago, I introduced to you a builder, an entrepreneur, an outsider, and the people's nominee for President of the United States. Tonight, I stand before you as the proud daughter of the people's president. He is our commander in chief, champion of the American worker, defender of common sense, and our voice for the forgotten men and women of this country. He is our president and my father, Donald J. Trump. This evening, I want to tell you about the leader I know and the moments I wish every American could see. I want to tell you the story of a president who is fighting for you from dawn to midnight, when the cameras have left, the microphones are off, and the decisions really count. When Jared and I moved with our three young children to Washington, we didn't exactly know what we were in for. But our kids, our kids loved it from the start. My son, Joseph, promptly built Grandpa a Lego replica of the White House. The President still displays it on the mantle in the Oval Office, right over there, so that he can show world leaders just so they know he has the greatest grandchildren on Earth. I agree. <laughs> over the last four years, we've learned a lot. I've seen in Washington it's easy for politicians to survive if they silence their convictions and skip the hard fights. I couldn't believe so many politicians actually prefer to complain about a problem rather than fix it. I was shocked to see people leave major challenges unsolved so they can blame the other side, campaign on the same issue in the next election. But Donald Trump did not come to Washington to win praise from the Beltway elites. Donald Trump came to Washington for one reason, and one reason alone, to make America great again. My father has strong convictions. He knows what he believes, and he says what he thinks. Whether you agree with him or not, you always know where he stands. I recognize that my dad's communication style is not to everyone's taste, and I know that his tweets can feel a bit unfiltered. But the results, the results speak for themselves. He is so unapologetic about his beliefs that he has caused me and countless Americans to take a hard look at our own convictions and ask ourselves, what do we stand for? What kind of America do we want to leave for our children? I am more certain than ever before we want a future where our kids can believe in American greatness. We want a society where every child can live in a safe community and go to a great school of their choice. We want a culture where differences of opinion and debate are encouraged, not canceled, where law enforcement is respected, where our country's rich diversity is celebrated, and where people of all backgrounds, races, genders, and creeds have the chance to achieve their God-given potential. This is the future my father is working to build each and every day. Building, after all, is what he's done his whole life. He has admired and befriended construction workers on countless job sites. But it has been a new and profound experience for him and for me to see these stoic machinists and steel workers come to him with a tear in their eye and thank him for being the only person willing to go to the mat for them, for their jobs, for their families, and for their futures. 
to the hardworking men and women across America and here tonight, you are the reason my father fights with all of his heart and all of his might. You are the reason he ran for president in the first place, and you are the reason he is going to keep fighting for four more years. One evening in early February of 2018, we were in the Oval Office with my father's top economic advisors, and the President was pushing to keep the promise he made to renegotiate the bad trade deals that had gutted millions of middle-class jobs. Most of his advisors argued that the economy was so strong following our historic tax and regulatory cuts that it didn't make sense to risk rocking the boat. After the meeting, as I walked with my father back towards the residence, he said, you know, the reason this has never been done before is because our leaders haven't had the guts. When the economy is good, they settle for good, and when things are bad, they don't have the will or ability, so they kick the can until it's someone else's problem. He was right. If my father didn't take on these fights, no one would. In the months that followed, President Trump refused to settle for a good deal. He wanted a great deal, and ultimately, that is exactly what we got. I remember each time he was updated on the progress of the new trade deal with Mexico and Canada, he would say, don't let down those dairy farmers I met in Wisconsin. I don't want them to like this deal. I want them to love it. <laughs> Today, in the midst of this unprecedented global pandemic, it's more clear than ever that our president was absolutely correct to take on trade when he did and bring our jobs, our factories, and our life-saving medicines back to the USA. As our nation endures this grave trial, I pray for the families who are mourning the loss of a loved one, for those who are battling COVID-19, and for the first responders and the healthcare heroes who remain on the front line of this fight. The grief, sorrow, and anxiety during this time is felt by all. I've been with my father, and I've seen the pain in his eyes when he receives updates on the lives that have been stolen by this plague. I have witnessed him make some of the most difficult decisions of his life. I sat with him in the Oval Office as he stopped travel to Europe. I watched him take the strongest, most inclusive economy in a lifetime the lowest unemployment in a half century, and the highest wage increase for working families in decades, and close it down to save American lives. It is why our president rapidly mobilized the full force of government and the private sector to produce ventilators within weeks, to build the most robust testing system in the world, and to develop safe and effective treatments, and very, very soon a vaccine. My father isn't deterred by defeatist thinkers. The word impossible, well, it only motivates him. Donald Trump rejects the cynical notion that this country's greatest achievements are behind us. He believes that nothing is beyond our reach and that the best is yet to come. I have seen all of my life, how my dad believes in the potential of each individual. Earlier this evening, we were all inspired by the incredible testimony of Alice Johnson, a great grandmother who was sentenced to life in prison for a first time nonviolent drug offense. I was with my father when he decided to commute Alice's life sentence. Together, we watched Alice leave prison after nearly 22 years. As she ran into the arms of her family and they celebrated a joyful reunion, my father got very quiet. I could see the emotion on his face. After a long silence, he looked at me and said, imagine how many people there are just like Alice. 
From that point on, he became a voice for those who had been unfairly silenced in our prison system. President Trump rectified the disparities of the 1994 Biden crime bill that disproportionately hurt African Americans. Yeah. Against all odds, he brought together Republicans and Democrats and passed the most significant criminal justice reform of our generation, and we're just getting started. My father did not campaign on this issue. He tackled this injustice because he has a deep compassion for those who have been treated unfairly. More than rhetoric and political prose, the ability to build consensus and achieve bipartisan success will help heal our country's racial inequities and bring us forward together. President Trump is advancing the American values of work and family. Four years ago in Cleveland, I said President Trump would deliver for working women. Last year, over 70 percent of all new jobs were secured by women. Four years ago, I told you my father would focus on making childcare affordable and accessible. In President Trump's first term, we secured the largest ever increase for childcare funding, giving more than 800,000 low-income families great childcare at a cost they can afford. As part of Republican tax cuts, in 2019 alone, our child tax credit put over $2,000 into the pockets of 40 million American families. Democrat politicians recently introduced a plan to increase the child tax credit. Yet when I was fighting less than three years ago at the president's direction to get Congress to double the child tax credit, not a single Democrat voted to pass the law. We got it done anyway. Four years ago, I promised that President Trump would support mothers in the workforce. In his first year in office, he signed into law the first-ever National Paid Leave Tax Credit. Today, eight million more Americans have access to this benefit. Four years ago, I said that Americans needed an economy that permits people to rise again. During President Trump's first three years in office, 72 percent of all new jobs went to Americans who had been outside of the workforce. Four years ago, I told you I would fight alongside my father, and four years later, here I am. Many of the issues my father has championed are not historically Republican priorities. Yet where Washington chooses sides, our president chooses common sense. Where politicians choose party, our president chooses people. Since the day he took the oath of office, I've watched my father take on the failed policies of the past and do what no leader has done before. Recently, he took dramatic action to cut the cost of prescription drugs, despite fielding angry calls from the CEOs of nearly every major pharmaceutical company. Now, when we see attack ads paid for by Big Pharma, my dad smiles and says to me, you know, we're doing something really right if they're hitting us so hard. <laughs> This spring, our president saw that American crops were going to waste because food supply chains were disrupted by the virus. He directed Secretary Perdue and me to find a way to get this nutritious food, fresh fruit, vegetables, meat and dairy, to families most in need. Within a matter of days, we launched the Farmers to Family Food Box Program, which has now delivered over 100 million meals to, into the hands of American families. To protect the most vulnerable among us, I've worked alongside the President as he signed into law nine pieces of legislation to combat the evil of human trafficking. Yeah. 
I've stood by my father's side at Dover Air Force Base as he's received our fallen heroes. And each time it has steeled his resolve to finally stop, finally stop the endless foreign wars. <laughs> to change the paradigm in the Middle East, he took a fresh approach. I heard foreign leaders beg him not to move the American embassy to Jerusalem, yet he delivered on a promise also made and unfulfilled by past presidents because my father knew that it was the right thing to do. <laughs> Defying all expectations, just weeks ago, he rewrote history again by making a peace agreement in the Middle East, the biggest breakthrough in a quarter century. For the first time in a long time, we have a president who has called out Washington's hypocrisy and they hate him for it. Dad, people attack you for being unconventional, but I love you for being real and I respect you for being effective. Our president refuses to surrender his beliefs to score point with the political elite. To my father, you are the elite. You are the only people he cares about scoring points with. If these problems were easy to solve, previous presidents would have done so. But you don't achieve different results by doing things the same way. Washington has not changed Donald Trump. Donald Trump has changed Washington. doesn't need another empty vessel who will do whatever the media and the fringe of his party demands. Now more than ever, America needs four more years of a warrior in the White House. Tonight, I could not be more proud to introduce my father, a man I know was made for this moment in history. My fellow Americans, our First Lady, and the 45th President of the United States, Donald J. Trump. First Lady uh, walking down, the, we'll walk down the stairway from the Blue Room, but first acknowledging the crowd laid out there on the South Lawn of the White House, Trump Pence signs, some things we don't normally see, uh, campaign signs uh, at the White House. No, we don't. Everything's un unconventional this year, and, and certainly this is as well. But the president, we know, wanted a crowd for his convention speech, and he's got it. 1,500 people um, on the South Lawn of the White House. And as many people have noticed, not socially distanced and not wearing masks, but as the chief of staff said today, it's their individual choice, and uh, they wanted to be here for the president's moment. Could be a clue for how he will frame uh, the fight against COVID as the uh, number of dead has surpassed now 180,000, but the uh, first couple taking a slow stroll. Uh, he wanted this pageantry, he wanted this imagery. Uh, actually, what he wanted was for the convention to be in North Carolina and then uh, Florida, um, but things didn't work out. And so here they are.
bring Chuck Todd in. Chuck, you've seen a lot in your coverage of Washington, but we've not I, ever seen a moment like this. No, and I'll admit, I'll just be honest, as sort of somebody who sort of has reverence for all the Washington, D.C. monuments that we have, this is jarring to see. Um, the White House star in a political advertisement like this in that in that way. I know what Donald Trump wanted and he's getting what he wanted. That's for sure. He wanted this crowd and he wanted it to be big. We expect his uh, remarks will be lengthy. Uh, this is his night, the last night of the Republican National Convention. He's got a crowd of thousands of people on the lawn there at the White House. And this is the president's moment to make his case for four more uh, years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Friends, delegates, and distinguished guests, please. I stand before you tonight honored by your support, proud of the extraordinary progress we have made together over the last four incredible years, and brimming with confidence in the bright future we will build for America over the next four years. We begin this evening. Our thoughts are with the wonderful people who have just come through the wrath of Hurricane Laura. We are working closely with state and local officials in Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, Mississippi, sparing no effort to save lives. While the hurricane was fierce, one of the strongest to make landfall in 150 years, the casualties and damage were far less than thought possible only 24 hours ago. And this is due to the great work of FEMA, law enforcement, and the individual states. I will be going this weekend. And congratulations. Thank you for that great job out there. We really appreciate it. We are one national family, and we will always protect, love, and care for each other. Here tonight are the people who have made my journey possible and filled my life with so much joy. For her incredible service to our nation and its children, I want to thank our magnificent First Lady. I also want to thank my amazing daughter, Ivanka, for that introduction, and to all of my children. Ivanka, please stand up. Thank you. And to all of my children and grandchildren, I love you more than words can express. I know my brother, Robert, is looking down on us right now from heaven. He was a great brother and was very proud of the job we are all doing. Thank you. We love you, Robert. Let us also take a moment to show our profound appreciation for a man who has always fought by our side and stood up for our views, a man of deep faith, our Vice President Mike Pence. And Mike is joined by his beloved wife, a teacher, and military mom, Karen Pence. Thank you, Karen. My fellow Americans, tonight, with a heart full of gratitude and boundless optimism, I profoundly accept this nomination for President of the United States.
the Republican Party, the party of Abraham Lincoln, goes forward united, determined, and ready to welcome millions of Democrats, independents, and anyone who believes in the greatness of America and the righteous heart of the American people. In a new term as President, we will again build the greatest economy in history, quickly returning to full employment, soaring incomes, and record prosperity. We will defend America against all threats and protect America against all dangers. We will lead America into new frontiers of ambition and discovery, and we will reach for new heights of national achievement. We will rekindle new faith in our values, new pride in our history, and a new spirit of unity that can only be realized through love for our great country. Because we understand that America is not a land cloaked in darkness, America is the torch that enlightens the entire world. Gathered here at our beautiful and majestic White House, known all over the world as the People's House, we cannot help but marvel at the miracle that is our great American story. This has been the home of larger-than-life figures like Teddy Roosevelt and Andrew Jackson, who rallied Americans to bold visions of a bigger and brighter future. Within these walls lived tenacious generals like President Grant and Eisenhower, who led our soldiers in the cause of freedom. From these grounds, Thomas Jefferson, sent Lewis and Clark on a daring expedition to cross a wild and uncharted continent. In the depths of a bloody civil war, President Abraham Lincoln looked out these very windows upon a half-completed Washington Monument and asked God, in his providence, to save our nation. Two weeks after Pearl Harbor, Franklin Delano Roosevelt welcomed Winston Churchill. And just inside, they set our people on a course to victory in the Second World War. In recent months, our nation and the entire planet has been struck by a new and powerful, invisible enemy. Like those brave Americans before us, we are meeting this challenge. We are delivering life-saving therapies and will produce a vaccine before the end of the year, or maybe even sooner. We will defeat the virus, end the pandemic, and emerge stronger than ever before. What united generations past was an unshakable confidence in America's destiny and an unbreakable faith in the American people. They knew that our country is blessed by God and has a special purpose in this world. It is that conviction that inspired the formation of our union, our westward expansion, the abolition of slavery, the passage of civil rights, the space program, and the overthrow of fascism, tyranny, and communism. This towering American spirit has prevailed over every challenge and lifted us to the summit of human endeavor. And yet, despite all of our greatness as a nation, everything we have achieved is now in danger. This is the most important election in the history of our country.
Thank you. At no time before have voters faced a clearer choice between two parties, two visions, two philosophies, or two agendas. This election will decide whether we save the American dream or whether we allow a socialist agenda to demolish our cherished destiny. It will decide whether we rapidly create millions of high-paying jobs or whether we crush our industries and send millions of these jobs overseas, as has foolishly been done for many decades. Your vote will decide whether we protect law-abiding Americans or whether we give free reign to violent anarchists and agitators and criminals who threaten our citizens. And this election will decide whether we will defend the American way of life or whether we will allow a radical movement to completely dismantle and destroy it. That won't happen. At the Democrat National Convention, Joe Biden and his party repeatedly assailed America as a land of racial, economic, and social injustice. So tonight, I ask you a simple question. How can the Democrat Party ask to lead our country when it spends so much time tearing down our country? In the left's backward view, they do not see America as the most free, just, and exceptional nation on Earth. Instead, they see a wicked nation that must be punished for its sins. Our opponents say that redemption for you can only come from giving power to them. This is a tired anthem spoken by every repressive movement throughout history. But in this country, we don't look to career politicians for salvation. In America, we don't turn to government to restore our souls. We put our faith in Almighty God. Joe Biden is not a savior of America's soul. He is the destroyer of America's jobs. And if given the chance, he will be the destroyer of American greatness. For 47 years, Joe Biden took the donations of blue-collar workers, gave them hugs and even kisses. and told them he felt their pain. And then he flew back to Washington and voted to ship our jobs to China and many other distant lands. Joe Biden spent his entire career outsourcing their dreams and the dreams of American workers, offshoring their jobs, opening their borders, and sending their sons and daughters to fight in endless foreign wars, wars that never ended. Four years ago, I ran for president because I could not watch this betrayal of our country any longer. I could not sit by as career politicians let other countries take advantage of us on trade, borders, foreign policy, and national defense. Our NATO partners, as an example, were very far behind in their defense payments. But at my strong urging, they agreed to pay $130 billion more a year, the first time in over 20 years that they upped their payments. And this $130 billion will ultimately go to $400 billion 
a year. And Secretary General Stoltenberg, who heads NATO, was amazed after watching for so many years and said that President Trump did what no one else was able to do. Thank you. From the moment I left my former life behind, and it was a good life, <laughs> I have done nothing but fight for you. I did what our political establishment never expected and could never forgive, breaking the cardinal rule of Washington politics. I kept my promise. <laughs> Together, we have ended the rule of the failed political class, and they are desperate to get their power back by any means necessary. You've seen that. They are angry at me because instead of putting them first, I very simply said, America first. Thank you. Days after taking office, we shocked the Washington establishment and withdrew from the last administration's job-killing Trans-Pacific Partnership. I then immediately approved the Keystone XL and Dakota Access Pipelines, ended the unfair and very costly Paris Climate Accord, and secured for the first time American energy independence. We passed record setting tax and regulation cuts at a rate nobody had ever seen before. Within three short years, we built the strongest economy in the history of the world. Washington insiders asked me not to stand up to China. They pleaded with me to let China continue stealing our jobs, ripping us off, and robbing our country blind. But I kept my word to the American people. We took the toughest, boldest, strongest, and hardest-hitting action against China in American history, by far. They said that it would be impossible to terminate and replace NAFTA. But again, they were wrong. Earlier this year, I ended the NAFTA nightmare and signed the brand-new U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement into law. And right now, auto companies and others are building their plants and factories in America, not firing their employees, and not deserting us for other countries. In perhaps no area did the Washington special interests try harder to stop us than on my policy of pro-American immigration. But I refuse to back down, and today America's borders are more secure than ever before. Thank you. We ended catch and release, stopped asylum fraud, took down human traffickers who prey on women and children, and we have deported 20,000 gang members and 500,000 criminal aliens. We have already built 300 miles of border wall, and we are adding 10 new miles every single week. The wall will soon be complete 
and it is working beyond our wildest expectations. We are joined this evening by members of the Border Patrol Union, representing our country's courageous border agents. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Brave, brave people. You see, this country loves our law enforcement. They do. They do. They really do. Love and respect. When I learned that the Tennessee Valley Authority laid off hundreds of American workers and forced them to train their lower-paid foreign replacement, I promptly removed the chairman of the board and now those talented American workers have been rehired and are back providing power to Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee, Kentucky, Mississippi, North Carolina, and Virginia. They have their old jobs back, and some are here with us this evening. Please stand. You went through a lot. Please stand. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've been through a lot. Thank you very much. Last month, I took on Big Pharma. You think that's easy? It's not. <laughs> and signed orders that will massively lower the cost of your prescription drugs and give critically ill patients access to life-saving cures. We passed the decades long awaited right to try, right to try. We also passed VA accountability and VA choice. Our great veterans, we're taking care of our veterans. 91% approval rating this month, the VA given by our veterans. First time anything like that's ever happened. By the end of my first term, we will have approved more than 300 federal judges, including two great new Supreme Court justices. And to bring prosperity to our forgotten inner cities, we worked hard to pass historic criminal justice reform, prison reform, opportunity zones, and long-term funding of historically black colleges and universities. And before the China virus came in, produced the best unemployment numbers for African Americans, Hispanic Americans, and Asian Americans ever recorded. And I say very modestly that I have done more for the African-American community than any president since Abraham Lincoln, our first Republican president. And I have done more in three years for the black community than Joe Biden has done in 47 years. And when I'm reelected, the best is yet to come.
Thank you very much. When I took office, the Middle East was in total chaos. ISIS was rampaging. Iran was on the rise. And the war in Afghanistan had no end in sight. I withdrew from the terrible, one-sided Iran nuclear deal. Unlike many presidents before me, I kept my promise, recognized Israel's true capital, and moved our embassy to Jerusalem. But not only did we talk about it as a future site, we got it built. Rather than spending $1 billion on a new building as planned, we took an already owned existing building in a better location. Real estate deal, right? <laughs> and opened it at a cost of less than $500,000. Many things like that that government is doing right now. We also recognized Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights. And this month, we achieved the first Middle East peace deal in 25 years. Thank you to UAE. Thank you to Israel. In addition, we obliterated 100 percent of the ISIS caliphate and killed its founder and leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Then, in a separate operation, we eliminated the world's number one terrorist by far, Qasim Soleimani. <laughs> Unlike previous administrations, I have kept America out of new wars, and our troops are coming home. Yes. We have spent nearly $2.5 trillion on completely rebuilding our military, which was very badly depleted when I took office, as you know. This includes three separate pay raises for our great warriors. We also launched the Space Force, the first new branch of the United States military since the Air Force was created almost 75 years ago. We have spent the last four years reversing the damage Joe Biden inflicted over the last 47 years. Biden's record is a shameful roll call of the most catastrophic betrayals and blunders in our lifetime. He has spent his entire career on the wrong side of history. Biden voted for the NAFTA disaster, the single worst trade deal ever enacted. He supported China's entry into the World Trade Organization, one of the greatest economic disasters of all time. After those Biden calamities, the United States lost one in four manufacturing jobs. We laid off workers in Michigan, Ohio, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, and many other states. They didn't want to hear Biden's hollow words of empathy. They wanted their jobs back. As Vice President, he supported the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which would have been a death sentence for the U.S. auto industry. He backed the horrendous South Korea trade deal, which took many jobs from our country and which I've reversed and made a great deal for our country. He repeatedly supported mass amnesty for illegal immigrants. 
He voted for the Iraq War. He opposed the mission to take out Osama bin Laden. He opposed killing Soleimani. He oversaw the rise of ISIS and cheered the rise of China as a positive development for America and the world, some positive development. That's why China supports Joe Biden and desperately wants him to win. I can tell you that upon very good information. <laughs> China would own our country if Joe Biden got elected. Unlike Biden, I will hold them fully accountable for the tragedy that they caused all over the world, they caused. In recent months, our nation and the world has been hit by the once-in-a-century pandemic that China allowed to spread around the globe. They could have stopped it, but they allowed it to come out. We are grateful to be joined tonight by several of our incredible nurses and first responders. Please stand and accept our profound thanks and gratitude. Many Americans, including me, have sadly lost friends and cherished loved ones to this horrible disease. As one nation, we mourn, we grieve, and we hold in our hearts forever the memories of all of those lives that have been so tragically taken, so unnecessary. In their honor, we will unite. In their memory, we will overcome. And when the China virus hit, we launched the largest national mobilization since World War II. Invoking the Defense Production Act, we produced the world's largest supply of ventilators. Not a single American who has needed a ventilator has been denied a ventilator, which is a miracle. Good job heading the task force by our great Vice President. Thank you very much, Mark. Please, please stand up. We shipped hundreds of millions of masks, gloves, and gowns to our frontline healthcare workers. To protect our nation's seniors, we rushed supplies, testing kits, and personal to nursing homes. We gave everything you can possibly give, and we're still giving it because we're taking care of our senior citizens. The Army Corps of Engineers built field hospitals, and the Navy deployed our great hospital ships. We developed from scratch the largest and most advanced testing system anywhere in the world. America has tested more than every country in Europe put together and more than every nation in the Western Hemisphere combined. Think of that. We have conducted 40 million more tests than the next closest nation, which is India. We developed a wide array of effective treatments, including a powerful antibody treatment known as convalescent plasma. You saw that on Sunday night when we announced it, that will save thousands and thousands of lives. Thanks to advances, we have pioneered the fatality rate. And you look at it, and you look at the numbers, it has been reduced by 80 percent since April, 80 percent. The United States has among the lowest case fatality rates of any major country anywhere in the world. The European Union's case fatality rate is nearly three times higher than ours, but you don't hear that. They don't write about that. They don't want to write about that. They don't want you to know those things. Altogether, the nations of Europe have experienced a 30 percent greater increase in excess mortality than the United States. Think of that. We enacted the largest package of financial relief in American history. Thanks to our Paycheck Protection Program, we have saved or supported more than 50 million American jobs. That's one of the reasons that we're advancing so rapidly with our economy. Great job. 
As a result, we have seen the smallest economic contraction of any major Western nation, and we are recovering at a much faster rate than anybody. Over the past three months, we have gained over 9 million jobs, and that's a record in the history of our country. Unfortunately, from the beginning, our opponents have shown themselves capable of nothing but a partisan ability to criticize. When I took bold action to issue a travel ban on China very early indeed, Joe Biden called it hysterical and xenophobic. And then I introduced a ban on Europe very early again. If we had listened to Joe, hundreds of thousands more Americans would have died. Instead of following the science, Joe Biden wants to inflict a painful shutdown on the entire country. His shutdown would inflict unthinkable and lasting harm on our nation's children, families, and citizens of all backgrounds. The cost of the Biden shutdown would be measured in increased drug overdoses, depression, alcohol addiction, suicides, heart attacks, economic devastation, job loss, and much more. Joe Biden's plan is not a solution to the virus, but rather it's a surrender to the virus. My administration has a very different approach. To save as many lives as possible, we are focusing on the science, the facts, and the data. We are aggressively sheltering those at highest risk, especially the elderly, while allowing lower-risk Americans to safely return to work and to school. And we want to see so many of those great states be open by Democrats. We want them to be open. They have to be open. They have to get back to work. They have to get back to work, and they have to get back to school. Most importantly, we are marshalling America's scientific genius to produce a vaccine in record time. Under Operation Warp Speed, we have three different vaccines in the final stage of trials. Right now, years ahead of what has been achieved before, nobody thought it could ever be done this fast. Normally, it would be years that we did it in a matter of a few months. We are producing them in advance so that hundreds of millions of doses will be quickly available. We will have a safe and effective vaccine this year, and together, we will crush the virus. At the Democrat convention, you barely heard a word about their agenda. But that's not because they don't have one. It's because their agenda is the most extreme set of proposals ever put forward by a major party nominee. Joe Biden may claim he is an ally of the light, but when it comes to his agenda, Biden wants to keep us completely in the dark. He doesn't have a clue. He has pledged a $4 trillion tax hike on almost all American families, which will totally collapse our rapidly improving economy and, once again, record stock markets that we have right now will also collapse. That means your 401ks. That means all of the stocks that you have. On the other hand, just as I did in my first term, I will cut taxes even further for hardworking moms and dads. I will not raise taxes. I will cut them, and very substantially. And we will also provide tax credits to bring jobs out of China back to America. And we will impose tariffs on any company that leaves America to produce jobs overseas. We will make sure our companies and jobs stay in our country, as I've already been doing for quite some time, if you've noticed. Joe Biden's agenda is made in China. My agenda is made in the USA. Yeah. Biden 
his promise to abolish the production of American oil, coal, shale, and natural gas, laying waste to the economies of Pennsylvania, Ohio, Texas, North Dakota, Oklahoma, Colorado, and New Mexico, destroying those states, absolutely destroying those states and others. Millions of jobs will be lost, and energy prices will soar. These same policies led to crippling power outages in California just last week. Everybody saw that. Tremendous power outage. Nobody's seen anything like it, but we saw that last week in California. How can Joe Biden claim to be an ally of the light when his own party can't even keep the lights on? <laughs> Joe Biden's campaign has even published a 110-page policy platform. You can't get away from this. Co-authored with far-left senator, crazy Bernie Sanders. The Biden-Bernie manifesto calls for suspending all removals of illegal aliens, implementing nationwide catch-and-release, and providing illegal aliens with free, taxpayer-funded lawyers. Everybody gets a lawyer. Come on over to our country. Everybody has a lawyer. We have a lawyer for you. That's what we need is more lawyers. <laughs> Joe Biden recently raised his hand on the debate stage and promised to your giveaway. He was going to give it away, your health care dollars to illegal immigrants, which is going to bring massive number of immigrants into our country. Massive numbers will pour into our country in order to get all of the goodies that they want to give, education, health care, everything. He also supports deadly sanctuary cities that protect criminal aliens. He promised to end national security travel bans from jihadist nations, and he pledged to increase refugee admissions by 700 percent. This is in the manifesto. The Biden plan would eliminate America's borders in the middle of a global pandemic. And he's even talking about taking the wall down. How about that? <laughs> Biden also vowed to oppose school choice and close all charter schools, ripping away the ladder of opportunity for black and Hispanic children. In a second term, I will expand charter schools and provide school choice to every family in America. And we will always treat our teachers with the tremendous respect that they deserve. Great people. Great, great people. Joe Biden claims he has empathy for the vulnerable, yet the party he leads supports the extreme late-term abortion of defenseless babies right up until the moment of birth. Democrat leaders talk about moral decency, but they have no problem with stopping a baby's beating heart in the ninth month of pregnancy. Democrat politicians refuse to protect innocent life and then they lecture us about morality and saving America's soul. Tonight, we proudly declare that all children, born and unborn, have a God-given right to life. During the Democrat convention, the words, under God, were removed from the Pledge of Allegiance. Not once, but twice. We will never do that. But the fact is, this is where they're coming from. Like it or not, this is where they're coming from. If the left gains power, they will demolish the suburbs, confiscate your guns, and appoint justices who will wipe away your Second Amendment and other constitutional freedoms. Biden is a Trojan horse for socialism. If Joe Biden doesn't have the strength to stand up to 
wild-eyed Marxists like Bernie Sanders and his fellow radicals. And there are many, there are many, many, we see them all the time. It's incredible, actually. Then how is he ever going to stand up for you? He's not. The most dangerous aspect of the Biden platform is the attack on public safety. The Biden-Bernie manifesto calls for abolishing cash bail, immediately releasing 400,000 criminals onto the streets and into your neighborhoods. When asked if he supports cutting police funding, Joe Biden replied, yes, absolutely. When Congresswoman Ilhan Omar called the Minneapolis Police Department a cancer that is rotten to the root, Biden wouldn't disavow her support and reject her endorsement. He proudly displayed it shortly later on his website. Displayed it in big letters. Make no mistake, if you give power to Joe Biden, the radical left will defund police departments all across America. They will pass federal legislation to reduce law enforcement nationwide. They will make every city look like Democrat-run Portland, Oregon. No one will be safe in Biden's America. My administration will always stand with the men and women of law enforcement. Every day, police officers risk their lives to keep us safe. And every year, many sacrifice their lives in the line of duty. One of these incredible Americans was Detective Miostas Familia. She was part of a team of American heroes called the NYPD, or New York's Finest, who I was very, very proud to get their endorsement just the other day. Great people, great, great people. They were allowed to do their job. You'd have no crime in New York. Rudy Giuliani knows that better than anybody. Thank you, Rudy. Three years ago, on the 4th of July weekend, Detective Familia was on duty in her vehicle when she was ambushed just after midnight and murdered by a monster who hated her purely for wearing the badge. Detective Familia was a single mom, she recently asked, for the night shift so she could spend more time with her kids. Two years ago, I stood in front of the U.S. Capitol alongside those beautiful children and held their grandmother's hand as they mourned their terrible loss. And we honored Detective Familia's extraordinary life. It was extraordinary. Detective Familia's three children are with us this evening. Genesis, Peter, Delilah, we are so grateful to have you here tonight. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I promise you that we will treasure your mom in our memories forever. We must remember that the overwhelming majority of police officers in this country, and that's the overwhelming majority, are noble, courageous, and honorable. We have to give law enforcement, our police, back their power. They are afraid to act. They are afraid to lose their pension. They are afraid to lose their jobs. And by being afraid, they are not able to do the job that they so desperately want to do for you. And those who suffer most are the great people who they protect and who they want to protect at an even higher level. When there is police misconduct, the justice system must hold wrongdoers fully and completely accountable, and it will. But when we can never have a situation where things are going on as they are today,
We must never allow mob rule. We can never allow mob rule. In the strongest possible terms, the Republican Party condemns the rioting, looting, arson, and violence we have seen in Democrat-run cities all, like Kenosha, Minneapolis, Portland, Chicago, and New York, and many others, Democrat-run. There is violence and danger in the streets of many Democrat-run cities throughout America. This problem could easily be fixed if they wanted to. Just call. We're ready to go in. We'll take care of your problem in a matter of hours. Just call. We have to wait for the call. It's too bad we have to, but we have to wait for the call. We must always have law and order. All federal crimes are being investigated, prosecuted, and punished to the fullest extent of the law. When the anarchists started ripping down our statues and monuments right outside, I signed an order immediately. Ten years in prison, and it was a miracle. It all stopped. No more statues. They said, that's just too long, as they looked at a statue. I think we'll rip it down. Then they said, ten years in prison. I think that's too long. Let's go home. During their convention, Joe Biden and his supporters remained completely silent about the rioters and criminals spreading mayhem in Democrat-run cities. They never even mentioned it during their entire convention, never once mentioned. Now they're starting to mention it because their poll numbers are going down like a rock in water. It's too late, Joe. In the face of left-wing anarchy and mayhem in Minneapolis, Chicago, and other cities, Joe Biden's campaign did not condemn it. They donated to it. At least 13 members of Joe Biden's campaign staff donated to a fund to bail out vandals, arsonists, anarchists, looters, and rioters from jail. Here tonight is the grieving family of retired police captain David Dorn, a 38-year veteran of the St. Louis Police Department, a great man and a highly respected man by all. In June, Captain Dorn was shot and killed as he tried to protect his store from rioters and looters, or as the Democrats would call them, peaceful protesters. They call them peaceful protesters. We're honored to be joined tonight by his wonderful wife, Anne, and beloved family members, Brian and Kaylin. To each of you, we will never forget the heroic legacy of Captain David Dorn. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great man. Great man. As long as I am president, we will defend the absolute right of every American citizen to live in security, dignity, and peace. If the Democrat Party wants to stand with anarchists, agitators, rioters, looters, and flag burners, that is up to them. But I, as your president, will not be a part of it. The Republican Party will remain the voice of the patriotic heroes who keep America safe and salute the American flag. Last year, over 1,000 African Americans were murdered as a result of violent crime in just four Democrat-run cities. The top 10 most dangerous cities in the country are run by Democrats and have been for many decades. Thousands more African Americans are victim and victims of violent crime in these communities. Joe Biden and the left ignore these American victims. I never will. If the radical left takes power, they will apply their disastrous policies to every city, town, and suburb in America. Just imagine if the so-called peaceful demonstrators in the streets were in charge of every lever of power in the U.S. government. Just think of that. 
Liberal politicians claim to be concerned about the strength of American institutions. But who exactly is attacking them? Who is hiring the radical professors, judges, and prosecutors? Who is trying to abolish immigration enforcement and establish speech codes designed to muzzle dissent? In every case, the attacks on American institutions are being waged by radical left. Always remember, they are coming after me because I am fighting for you. That's what's happening. And it's been going on from before I even got elected. And remember this, they spied on my campaign and they got caught. Let's see now what happens. We must reclaim our independence from the left's repressive mandates. Americans are exhausted trying to keep up with the latest lists of approved words and phrases and the ever more restrictive political decrees. Many things have a different name now, and the rules are constantly changing. The goal of cancel culture is to make decent Americans live in fear of being fired, expelled, shamed, humiliated, and driven from society as we know it. The far left wants to coerce you into saying what you know to be false and scare you out of saying what you know to be true. Very sad. But on November 3rd, you can send them a very thundering message they will never forget. Thank you. Thank you very much. Joe Biden is weak. He takes his marching orders from liberal hypocrites who drive their cities into the ground while fleeing far from the scene of the wreckage. These same liberals want to eliminate school choice while they enroll their children in the finest private schools in the land. They want to open our borders while living in Waldorf compounds and communities in the best neighborhoods in the world. They want to defund the police while they have armed guards for themselves. This November, we must turn the page forever on this failed political class. The fact is, I'm here. What's the name of that building? But I'll say it differently. The fact is, we're here, and they're not. To me, one of the most beautiful buildings anywhere in the world, and it's not a building, it's a home, as far as I'm concerned. Not even a house, it's a home. It's a wonderful place with an incredible history. But it's all because of you. Together, we will write the next chapter of the great American story. Over the next four years, we will make America into the manufacturing superpower of the world. We will expand opportunity zones. Thank you, Tim Scott. Bring home our medical supply chains, and we will end our resilience for bad things. We will go right after China. We will not rely on them one bit. We are taking our business out of China. We are bringing it home. We want our business to come home. We will continue to reduce taxes and regulations at levels not seen before. We will create 10 million jobs in the next 10 months. And it'll be higher than that. 
We will hire more police, increase penalties for assaults on law enforcement, and surge federal prosecutors into high-crime communities. We will ban deadly sanctuary cities and ensure that federal health care is protected for American citizens, not for illegal aliens. We will have strong borders. And I've said for years, without borders, we don't have a country. Don't have a country. Strike down terrorists who threaten our people and keep America out of endless and costly foreign wars. We will appoint prosecutors, judges, justices who believe in enforcing the law, not enforcing their own political agenda, which is illegal. We will ensure equal justice for citizens of every race, religion, color, and creed. We will uphold your religious liberty and defend your Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. And if we don't win, your Second Amendment doesn't have a chance. I can tell you that. I have totally protected it. We will protect Medicare and Social Security. We will always and very strongly protect patients with pre-existing conditions. And that is a pledge from the entire Republican Party. Thank you, Kevin. We will end surprise medical billing, require price transparency, and further reduce the cost of prescription drugs and health insurance premiums. They're coming way down. We will greatly expand energy development, continuing to remain the number one in the world and keep America energy independent. And for those of you that still drive a car, look how low your gasoline bill is. You haven't seen that in a long time. We will win the race to 5G and build the world's best cyber and missile defense already under construction. We will fully restore patriotic education to our schools and always protect we will always, always protect free speech on college campuses. And we put a very big penalty in. If they do anything having to do with your free speech, colleges have to pay a tremendous, tremendous financial penalty. And again, it's amazing how open they've been lately. We will launch a new age of American ambition in space. America will land the first woman on the moon, and the United States will be the first nation to plant its beautiful flag on Mars. This is the unifying national agenda that will bring our country together. So tonight, I say to all Americans, this is the most important election in the history of our country. There has never been such a difference between two parties or two individuals in ideology, philosophy, or vision than there is right now. Our opponents believe that America is a depraved nation. We want our sons and daughters to know the truth. America is the greatest and most exceptional nation in the history of the world. Our country wasn't built by cancel culture, speech codes, and We are not a nation of timid spirits. We are a nation of fierce, proud, and independent American patriots. We are a nation of pilgrims, pioneers, adventurers, explorers, 
and trailblazers who refuse to be tied down, held back, or in any way reined in. Americans have steel in their spines, grit in their souls, and fire in their hearts. There is no one like us on Earth. I want every child in America to know that you are part of the most exciting and incredible adventure in human history. No matter where your family comes from, no matter your background in America, anyone can rise. With hard work, devotion, and drive, you can reach any goal and achieve every ambition. Our American ancestors sailed across the perilous ocean to build a new life on a new continent. They braved the freezing winters, crossed the raging rivers, scaled the rocky peaks, trekked the dangerous forests, and worked from dawn till dusk. These pioneers didn't have money. They didn't have fame. But they had each other. They loved their families. They loved their country. And they loved their God. When opportunity beckoned, they picked up their Bibles, packed up their belongings, climbed into their covered wagons, and set out west for the next adventure. Ranchers and miners, cowboys and sheriffs, farmers and settlers, they pressed on past the Mississippi to stake a claim in the wild frontier. Legends were born. Wyatt Earp, Annie Oakley, Davy Crockett, and Buffalo Bill. Americans built their beautiful homesteads on the open range. Soon they had churches and communities, then towns, and with time, great centers of industry and commerce. That is who they were. Americans build their future. We don't tear down our past. We are the nation that won a revolution toppled tyranny and fascism, and delivered millions into freedom. We laid down the railroads, built the great ships, raised up the skyscrapers, revolutionized industry, and sparked a new age of scientific discovery. We set the trends in art and music, radio and film, sport and literature, and we did it all with style and confidence and flair, because that is who we are. Whenever our way of life was threatened, our heroes answered the call. From Yorktown to Gettysburg, from Normandy to Iwo Jima, American patriots raced into cannon blasts, bullets, and bayonets to rescue American liberty. They had no fear, but America didn't stop there. We looked into the sky and kept pressing onward. We built a six million pound rocket and launched it thousands of miles into space. We did it so that two brave patriots could stand tall and salute our wondrous American flag planted on the face of the moon. For America, Nothing is impossible. Over the next four years, we will prove worthy of this magnificent legacy. We will reach stunning new heights, and we will show that the world, for America, there is a dream, and it is not beyond your reach. Together, we are unstoppable. Together, we are unbeatable, because together, we are the proud citizens of the United States of America. And on November 3rd, we will make America safer. We will make America stronger.
We will make America prouder. And we will make America greater than ever before. I am very, very proud to be the nominee of the Republican Party. I love you all. God bless you, and God bless America. Thank you very much. In a moment that uh, probably the first thing we've heard in the last two weeks, it kind of felt like we were at a traditional convention, of course, but this was not a traditional location. The White House, the president, uh, finishing up about an hour and 10 minutes of remarks. Savannah, there was a lot of talk over the last few weeks that the Republicans were having trouble finding their talking point against Joe Biden. It's very clear now. It's, it's a anarchy, it's the fear in the suburbs, some of the same themes we've heard over the last couple of days being capsulized in that speech. Well, this speech had a little bit of something for everyone. It was part uh, a recitation of what they say are their accomplishments in the first four years as we watch these fireworks over uh, the National Mall there, spelling out the president's name, uh, 2020. Also had a, you know, a, a very um, harsh attack on Joe Biden, no question about that. But it, as the speech went on, I, as I turned to Chuck Todd and we watched this unfolding, Chuck, it, it was less um, the Trump we see at convention speeches or State of the Union speeches and got into kind of this, the Trump we're used to seeing at rallies, ad-libbing well, and funny. feeling loose. Yeah, it's funny you say that. I actually thought it was either toned down rally Trump or upbeat State of the Union Trump. The point is, you know, it felt like he, he was sort of vacillating between the two. There was times that it felt like a State of the Union that was looking backwards. He was not telling you what he was going to do. He was recitating what he believes are his accomplishments. But I think the speech can be summed up in four words, and it was something he ad-libbed, guys. We're here and they're not. To me, this acceptance speech and his agenda was basically his whole goal is to just stop Joe Biden and own the libs or own the, you know, stop the Democrats. This was an acceptance speech that felt uh, about him articulating what he's against more than what he's for. And let me bring in Andrea Mitchell at that point. Andrea, did you get a, a sense of a broader understanding of, of, of what the plan would be for the next four years? No, I did not. In, in truth, I, it seems as though it's more of the same, and it's to take ownership more, to solidify his ownership, if you will. He's always resented the fact that he lost the popular vote, and now he's got a challenging re-election bid, although there is certainly a path to re-election, and he wants to cement a legacy, but I'm not sure what it is. I think the, the most notable thing about tonight is the venue, the fact that he staged this large a gathering during a pandemic without masks, without social distancing, in a sacred place, really, a, a, an historic landmark, the White House, a public place. Nothing like this has ever been done. It's of questionable legality. And it certainly is going to raise many questions going into the future about how this could be done. Indeed, a spectacle as the fireworks continue to go off. We'll take a break. We'll be back right after this. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we could just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. We actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. A country reeling from a pandemic and racial injustice. The story changes hourly. The president's push to get children back into school is sinking in among families who are debating the safety of it. It's the 11th hour. 
This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. This year's election is going to be a little different. Instead of one election day, we now have a voting season. That special time of year when polls can open weeks before election day. When your mailbox can become a voting booth. When how you vote is just as important as who you vote for. How, when, and where to cast your ballot depends on your state. Tis the season to be prepared. This year, plan your vote. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. This is the conclusion of the Republican National Convention. The fireworks appear to have stopped, and the Trump family is gathered at the White House listening to some music, a serenade. Uh, don't know that song. Do you know that song, Lester? Uh, you put me on the spot. <laughs> well, that opera. It is opera. That we do know. Well, I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> that was as best as I could do. So with the conclusion of night four, the Republican convention is over. The stage is now set for the campaign to come. Over the past two weeks, both parties, both tickets have had their say. And now comes the sprint to Election Day, November 3rd, just 68 days from now. And mail-in voting starting in just a matter of weeks in many, many states. And anyone's guess how things will play out in this unpredictable year, we'll be here to cover it all for you, including those all-important debates scheduled for September and October. Need I say it? Fasten your seatbelts. All right. I'm going to see you tomorrow morning on Today. And Craig Melvin has an interview with Kamala Harris. And I'll see you on Nightly News. Until then, for Savannah, Chuck, Andrea, and all of us at NBC News, I'm Lester Holt in New York. Good night, everyone. Someone once said that America is great because it is good. And that if America ceases to be good, it will no longer be great. It is the goodness in Americans that informs the greatness of America. I have to